The debate on eternal security or once saved, always saved has been raging on for centuries. And recently something just dropped that added to that debate. And it was a new documentary on once saved, always saved. Now it's kind of posed as a question, once saved, always saved, but uh, it's not a question because always saved in the in the what you call the poster of the documentary is crossed out. So we can infer from that that this documentary is not agreeing with one saved, always saved. And I haven't seen it. So in this live stream, I'm going to be reacting to it blindly. I haven't seen anything about it. I've, I've seen other people talk about it, uh, but I haven't watched it myself. So we're going to watch it and go through it and see what they say and compare it to what the scripture is saying. And of course, you all know I'm a grace preacher. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not biased in this. But if what they're saying is true, the scriptures will prove it. And if not, the scriptures will reveal it. So let's get ready to jump straight into the live reaction. Daniel, amen. Thank you so much for joining. So we're ready to jump into it. Let me just share this screen real quick and throw on my earbuds. All right. If y'all can see it, I'm sure y'all can see it. Oh, also, before we get started, uh, I'm, I just have a sheet of paper and a pen. I'm not going to be interrupting too much because I want us to get, hopefully, it's in sections that we can break down. Um, if if not, then we'll just pause it at maybe three to five minutes and break down what they're saying. But I'll be taking notes so we can kind of go through the most important stuff. We can go through everything. So, yeah, I think that's it. We can get started. Once saved, always saved, flies in the face of the constant teaching of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation's end. The major evangelical voices are saying, you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't really matter how you live after you're saved. You're saved. We might have our lives cut short as a result of sinful living. We might lose some of our heavenly reward, but no matter what we do, no matter how we live, we're still saved. I grew up in an assembly which uh, taught that, that I've accepted Christ and now I'm guaranteed for all eternity. And the danger of that is that you tend to relax. Once saved, always saved makes the wide way acceptable. We're Christianizing the wide way. We have cut the whole idea of transformed living. We've cut it off at the knees. I believe it's a lot of the explanation of the hypocrisy in the American church and much of the church around the world today because there's a lot of people that are living like hypocrites because they've been taught that they don't have to live holy lives. I mean, we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about uh, eternal life. It's not over till it's over. No Christian life should be judged in advance of death. The idea that you can be forgiven, reconciled, cleansed, now live an unrepentant, sinful life and somehow be a child of God is completely contrary to the whole testimony of Scripture and something that was unknown through much of church history. Believers in once saved, always saved invariably take the high ground historically as though they're defending the historic faith. This is incredibly dishonest. That's because before Augustine's novel teachings in the early fifth century, absolutely no one in the early church believed in once saved, always saved. I know of no patristic scholar or church historian who disputes that fact. The patristic fathers did not believe in once saved, always saved. They believed there was a possibility of turning from Christ. And so they would have a position much like modern Arminians on the possibility of apostasy. There wasn't some kind of airtight guarantee of salvation, regardless of your belief or behavior. And the Christians were known for their changed behavior. They were a community that was different. Those are the days when people were being martyred for the sake of their faith. They wouldn't deny Christ. I mean, they only had to say one word and they, they wouldn't be killed but they wouldn't do it. They were so faithful and such people understand the doctrine much clearer than we who live in such comfort today. The first generation of Christians after the apostles were in a unique position to make a bold statement that no generation of Christians ever since has been able to make. This is the faith that was handed to us by the apostles. In fact, the first generation of these Christians were personally discipled by the apostles. Men like Clement of Rome, Ignatius, and Polycarp. They had inherited a Bible that taught people to believe, 
to obey. They knew no other way in the early church than faithfulness over the long haul. The early church fathers actually warned against the idea of, of once saved, always saved, because that doctrine was found not within any Christian churches at the time. It was found among the Gnostics. The Gnostics were heretics who denied that the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. They also believed that our flesh was inherently corrupt. Furthermore, they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. And John refers to them in 1 John 4, verse 3, as the Antichrist. And in their refutations of the Gnostics, uh, they, would, they would mention how these Gnostics believed that you could never fall away from the faith, that you were uh, essentially eternally secure. Origen wrote about one group of Gnostics. He said, quote, They essentially destroy free will by introducing ruined natures incapable of salvation and by introducing others as being saved in such a way that they cannot be lost. Irene states, but as to themselves, speaking of the Gnostics, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. It is impossible that spiritual substance by which they mean themselves should ever come under the power of corruption. Wherefore also it comes to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scriptures assure us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They run us down, that is the true Christians, who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word as utterly contemptible. Cyprian said, you are still in the world. You are still in the battlefield. You daily fight for your lives. So you must be careful that what you have begun to be with such a blessed commencement will be consummated in you. It is a small thing to have first received something. It is a greater thing to be able to keep what you have attained. Faith itself and the saving birth do not make alive by merely being received. Rather, they must be preserved. Justin Martyr, I hope. All right. So there's a lot going on. Uh, let me just write this down so we can cover it. All right. Let's tackle this one by one. They're still on the early church, but I've already filled up <laughs> a little page with, with my notes. So. Let's look at some of the things that he said. So when they opened up the, you know, there's clips from later on in the documentary. I'm sure we're going to see those clips in full. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that until we get to when they said those things in context. But he said things like uh, you, you tend to relax if you're preaching a gospel of once saved, always saved. And what do you mean by relax? You see, people try to present this Christian walk as something that you must be working for. Otherwise, if you're relaxing and to them, relaxing means living in sin, but relaxing simply means resting. The Bible says in Hebrews that the Israelites, the reason they could not attain righteousness, the reason they didn't receive the fullness of the promise that God gave to Abraham, and we are beneficiaries of that promise, is because they could not enter into his rest. Why? Because of unbelief. So, when we relax in Christ, we're not saying it's okay to go on sinning. This is one misconception that is very, very common. When they create the straw man, straw man arguments and say, oh, when people, when people preach once saved, always saved, they're saying you can just go on and sin. And I always say that no authentic grace preacher says, hey, because you will never lose your salvation, you can go on and sin. That's, that's misre misrepresenting the argument of a grace preacher, okay? You, no one says that. No grace preacher says you can go on and sin. A grace preacher says that because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished, sin does not remove you from being in Christ. But you, because of who you are, because of your identity in Christ as a righteous person, you need to live according to that because nothing else makes sense. Not, it doesn't make sense to live like a dog when you're a human, but living like a dog will not, uh, living like a dog will not make you a dog. You will still remain human. So living like a sinner is not who you are. So repent from that, not because you're trying to work for your salvation, but because of who you are, because of your identity. That's what a grace preacher says. And so uh, another thing that he said was uh, it makes the wide way acceptable. The wide way is not sin. The wide way is everything besides faith in Jesus. 
The narrow road, the narrow gate is Jesus himself. If you have believed, you have entered into eternal life. And like I said, they probably say that in a different part of the documentary in context. So we'll get to that. He said, you not live a holy life. And again, I've never met anyone who truly understood grace and said, now I'm a while out in sin. No, no grace preacher preaches that. No one who has truly understood grace says, I won't live a holy life because of grace. Okay. And Paul, who understood grace more than arguably anyone else, look, he 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 lived it and walked the, the talk all the way to his death. So, I mean, he's a poster child for what happens when you truly understand grace. And uh, there was one comment that one of the people passed. <clears throat> excuse me and he said you cannot be judged in advance of death so in other words you can't judge your salvation until you die you have no assurance so and it's easy for them to point to other people oh you shouldn't be judging your salvation before your death but if you were to ask them well what about you do you think you're saved either they'll say i don't know which is fair because of their argument they should say they don't know because they have no assurance but if there's even a little bit of confidence that they are saved, they are already contradicting that. And the Bible says in 1 John that he's writing this letter, I believe in 1 John chapter 2, that we may know that we have eternal life. We may know. You can know that you have eternal life. Why? Because when you have eternal life, it is assured. But we'll get to that. Let's go to some of the stuff they said about the early church. No church fathers uh, believed in once saved, always saved. I'm not going to pretend that I have... Uh, a deep knowledge about early church history. I always tell people that there's a place for looking at what came before us, but nothing trumps the Bible. So if you bring me Tertullian and Origen and uh, Ignatius and and uh, um, and, and uh, Athanasius, and you bring all these people, and you say they taught this, but it doesn't line up with scripture, it doesn't matter if they lived in the first century. It doesn't matter if they were a disciple of John. If they don't believe and teach what is presented in scripture, it is subject to the same scrutiny as anyone preaching today. If just because they lived in an earlier period than us doesn't mean that they knew everything or that they understood everything in scripture. In fact, today, some people will say revelation is progressive. Like we understand more because of those who have come before us. But a lot of those same people will say, well, if those who came before us did not believe this, then we should not believe that. A lot of these people, I haven't seen a Catholic priest, maybe I missed one, but I haven't seen a Catholic priest in any of this. Um, but prior to Martin, Martin Luther's uh, nailing of the 99 Thesis and the Reformation, if you're going pre-Reformation, then you should be Catholic. Why are you a Protestant? Why are you an evangelical Christian? If a lot of the church fathers are more aligned with the Catholic faith, they're more aligned with Catholic beliefs. Why are you an evangelical? You should be Catholic but you're not. So why are you going to what they say? And, and, and if it's against the Bible, if it's contrary to what the Bible is actually teaching, you now take it when you don't do everything that they did, you don't believe everything that they believed. Uh, they said that the, the people who lived in the early church were prepared to die. They would not deny Christ. And that's true because they were literally killed for their faith. And he said they wouldn't die uh, because he said they wouldn't die and he was relating it to, or they wouldn't renounce Christ. I mean, sorry. And he was relating it to the fact that you can lose salvation. Uh, no, that's not why they didn't renounce Christ. It was because they truly believed that Jesus is who he, he who he is. He is the son of God. He lived and died and was raised up on the third day. They, they truly believed that every single one of the apostles died and was martyred except for John who died on, on the island of Patmos. Because they believe that they, they didn't go to the death because they were afraid that if they renounce Christ, they'll go to hell. They went to the death because it's the truth. So we need to we need to see the difference. You see, they're creating these scenarios that don't really line up with what actually happened biblically or historically. Um, they said the Gnostics preach once saved, always saved. They say that a broken clock is one, it's right at least twice a day. But the, the reasoning of the Gnostics is not the same thing. The reason of the Gnostics, according to them, is that because we are spiritual by nature, we can't lose salvation. And they also believe that the flesh is inherently evil. The only things that matter are the things of the spirit. Okay, that's why they didn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, because our bodies are evil, according to the Gnostics. Is this the argument of someone who believes in one saved, always saved? 
No, it's not. The argument of someone who believes in one saved, always saved, is that because of our birth in Christ, because of who we have become in Christ, our righteousness, relating it always to God, not because we are spiritual in nature, but because Jesus has made us one with the Father. He has reconciled us. He has given us peace with God, Romans 5 verse 1, because of what he did. It's always about him. Because of what he did, we are free. We are saved. We are secure. It's always about Christ. It's never about us. Um, and they said that uh, we're still on the battlefield. I mean, if you if you live your Christian life thinking that your Christian life is a battle between good and evil and not a, uh, an issue of you living and maturing into who you already are, that's your misunderstanding. That's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, there, there are trials and tribulations and things that we face, but the Christian life is not a battlefield. There are battles, but a Christian life is life. <laughs> it's not it's not battles 24-7. It's who you are. That's like saying being a human being is, is a battlefield, like you're trying so hard to not be a human. No, you're a human, and there are things that happen in life. In the same way, you are a child of God, and there are things that come your way that you, as a child of God, uh, God uses to mature you, but it doesn't mean that you're fighting to to preserve. That's the last part that we just looked at. You're trying to preserve your salvation. If uh, if you could if you couldn't lose it, there will be no reason for you to fight to preserve what you have attained. I didn't attain anything. Okay, so the, what the church fathers are saying, church fathers, Jesus said, "Call no one father," but we're calling people church fathers. That's fine, <laughs> but. Um, we haven't attained anything. We lost everything. We were nobody. We were dead in our sins. Who are we to say that we attained salvation? No, we received salvation by grace, which means by the power of God, by the enabling power of God through faith, by believing in Jesus. That's how we receive salvation. We didn't attain it. We didn't work for it. We did nothing. <laughs> so there's nothing for me to preserve. There's only rest. There's only God did it. No DJ Khaled, but God did it, and I'm here, and I'm resting in what he has done. So uh, keep what you've attained doesn't make sense when you didn't attain anything. And I'm sure work out your salvation is going to come up somewhere in this. Um, and then faith must be preserved, which I've kind of hinted at already. So uh, let's keep moving. I won't do it too much on each section. We're only five minutes in, so let's let's keep going. I hold further that those of you who have confessed and known this man to be Christ, yet who have gone back for some reason to the legal dispensation and have denied that this man is Christ and have not repented before death, you will by no means be saved. By the beginning of the fifth century, Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo, laid the foundation for the modern doctrine of once saved, always saved. You get then to Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, who starts off like the fathers that came before him, and then he evolves into something much more akin to what we would call Calvinism today. Augustine is the big um, transition figure, no question. Early on, he was not someone who affirmed eternal security. At first, he taught the freedom of the will in his uh, early Christianity, but in his uh, later Christianity, he began to deny free will. Augustine was a, a Manichaean a Gnostic for about nine, ten years of his life before he became a professing Christian and ended up becoming the top theologian of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the early fifth century, a British monk named Pelagius criticized a statement that Augustine had made in his confessions. Augustine had declared to God, grant what you command and command what you desire. Well, this made it appear that everything in our obedience comes from God and nothing comes from man. And rather than admitting that he had overstated things in his confessions, he swung 180 degrees in the opposite direction of the historic faith and declared that man can do absolutely nothing toward his own salvation. He said that every bit of our salvation comes from God, from our initial faith. Hold on. Do you hear how he's complaining that God does all the work? I mean, I don't attack people. I'm not, I'm not concerned about this, this gentleman, but 
it's very common. Like you can hear it in his voice. You're saying man contributes nothing to his salvation. And that's what they're attacking Augustine for that. Okay. He started off by believing that you could lose your salvation or he started off by believing in uh, the Gnostic faith. And then he got converted to Christianity, but he's one of your church fathers, but simply because he looked at the scriptures and came to the conclusion that, wait a minute, man can actually do nothing to be saved, except that God does everything. Because of that, he's no longer part of the, the same church fathers that you're looking at to understand. Now that there's um, there's one who is not in line with what you believe, let's, let's cut him out, right? That's not how it works. If a, And ironically, I went to a Catholic school, um, a high school called St. Augustine's College, um, of course, named after him. But anyway, if if Augustine said uh, nothing comes from man, why are you so upset about that? Why do you want to work like you? You sound like a Pharisee. I'm not saying you are a Pharisee, but you sound like that Pharisee who said, God, look at what I have done. Thank thank you that I'm not like this sinful man who is unknown to the uh, Pharisee praying and just begging for God's mercy, admitting that he can do nothing right. OK, you. I don't know if I'm the only one getting that, but it just sounds like anger towards the fact that you're telling me I can't work for it. Like, who are you to tell me that God does everything? If you can take God's job, well, <laughs> you know, uh, let me see, let me see. The legal dispensation. I don't want to cover every single thing. Let's let's move on. Faith, our obedience, and our enduring to the end. Augustine swung the pendulum in the opposite direction. More. And during to the end is one big thing. I'm sure they'll talk about it later, but we'll, we'll get to that as well. And our obedience and uh, how that plays into salvation, how being obedient to Christ or obedient to God plays into salvation. We'll get into all of that. Or, you know, more in the direction of his Manichaean Gnosticism, which had a view that there were the elect among the Manichaeans and the elect, you know, they were, once they were saved, they were always saved. They would persevere uh, in the Manichaean faith, which was not Christian at all. This resurrection of Gnostic teaching by Augustine should have sent shockwaves throughout the church. But Augustine wrote in Latin, and so much of what he said was never read by the Greek-speaking Eastern Christians, and they never adopted his theology. His impact might have been much less if there hadn't been much later an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. In the Reformation of the 16th century, you have Luther, who believes, just like the fathers on this, he believes that it is possible to commit apostasy. He actually comes against the teaching of once saved, always saved, but he did believe that there were certain people that were given the special gift, uh, who were the elect, who would be given the gift of perseverance. His view of perseverance seems to be the same as Augustine, that we can never be sure in this life that we will be given the gift of perseverance until the day of our death. For Luther, there was the warning of final damnation for those who fell away and walked away from the faith. So it's really amazing. You have the once saved, always saved doctrine repudiated by the early church. You know, the first three centuries of church history, uh, you have Augustine picking it up from the Gnostics and bringing it into the church, but only teaching that uh, the elect among saved people uh, will persevere and no one knows who they are. And then you have it going to John Calvin. I think Calvin is one who takes it even further. Um, like, I guess that's why we call it Calvinism, not Lutheranism. Once saved, always saved, as we know it today, actually stems back to John Calvin and his father. No, it stems back to the Bible. Okay. Why is it that it doesn't strike? Why doesn't it surprise them that someone who started against once saved, always saved, eventually, after presumably much study, comes to the conclusion that once saved, always saved is true. Why doesn't that set off alarm bells like, hey, what did he see in the scriptures that made him change his mind? Why is it not that, but instead it's, oh, he started off on the right path and then now he's he's no longer on the right path. That would be like a Pharisee seeing Apostle Paul. I mean, again, I'm not calling them Pharisees. It's just the connection is you can see it. But that'd be like a, a Pharisee saying, Instead of asking, why did Paul change his mind? What did he encounter on that road to Damascus that made him change his mind from a persecutor to a preacher of the gospel? 
And instead of the Pharisee asking that, they're like, oh, Paul left us. He left our camp. So we no longer associate with him. No questions asked. We're just going to always brand him as uh, a defector to the Jewish faith um, or defector from the Jewish faith. But we're never going to even question why or how he came to that conclusion. And attributing it to John Calvin, again, Calvin didn't get everything right. Like no man, any religion or denomination that has a person's name with an ism at the end is not something you should subscribe to. You should subscribe only to what the word of God says. But if John Calvin also believed in what the word of God says, then that's what the word of God says. And it has nothing to do with the man. Okay. If he created his own religion uh, and came up with, for example, the five tenets of Calvinism or uh, tulip, as they call it, then you can start to um, attribute that to his understanding and uh, what he came up with. But if he is believing something that is in the scriptures, it's not about Calvin anymore. It's about the scriptures. Uh, let's see. Let's go backwards a little bit. It says Augustine didn't believe in free will. Now, another misconception and another false accusation um, that people make towards one saved, always save that doctrine is you're saying people have no free will. Okay, that's not true. The problem is people are mistaken in in the extent of or in what the, in what free will actually does, or what uh, in the in how far free will goes. They are mistaken in that. If you are born, I'm born Ghanaian. Okay, I was born Ghanaian. It doesn't. I have free will. It doesn't matter how much free will I have. I can never will myself to be Japanese, like. My blood, my you can trace my ancestry all the way back. It will always tell you that I come from West Africa. No matter how much free will I have, it doesn't change that. Okay. Um, let me. I always I keep forgetting to make myself bigger here so y'all can actually see me. Sorry. So no matter how much uh I I try or will myself to be Japanese, because I love the Japanese culture, I love anime, I I enjoyed listening to the language. Like I can't make myself Japanese. So if you say when, if someone preaches eternal security and you say someone is saved forever, you are, you are negating their free will. It doesn't make sense because their free will doesn't change their identity. When you get saved, uh, Jesus told Nicodemus in John three, you must be born again. That is a literal birth. It's a spiritual rebirth. And John one verse 12 and 13 says, he gave those who believed in Jesus the power to be children of God who are not born of blood or of the will of man or of the flesh, but born of God. So if you are born of God, that means spiritually your DNA, your DNA, your spiritual DNA is God's spiritual DNA. That, that's why his spirit is in you. That's why you've been made alive. That is why the Bible says Jesus became sin so that we would be made, not just have but be made the righteousness of God in him. So that's your new nature. That's your new identity. It doesn't matter how much free will you have. You can't will yourself out, in, out of your DNA. You can't change your DNA. And that applies even more so to your spiritual DNA than your natural DNA. Um, okay, so the gift of perseverance. There are a lot of things that Luther got wrong. And so them saying Luther got this right in the beginning or he was preaching this in the beginning makes no sense. I was against the gospel of grace. I was against the doctrine of one saved, always saved in the beginning. Most grace preachers that I know were against one saved, always saved in the beginning. But I would say that they humbled themselves and let the scriptures speak rather than feeling like it's such an insult to say that God did everything and they did nothing. But we most of us start from that place of not believing at first. So. That, that doesn't mean anything. Let's keep going. Followers. He wrote his work of systematic theology entitled Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is largely built on Augustine's teachings. He says that his whole theology could be uh, systemized through by just quoting Augustine's teaching. The main difference between Calvin and Augustine is that although Augustine emphasized that we cannot know for certain until the day of our death, that we are of the elect, 
Calvin emphasized that there are clear indications in this life. But it was Calvin who basically took that last idea that, you know, the elector gave him the gift of perseverance and said that all Christians, anyone who comes to Christ and receives him, uh, has the gift of perseverance and will be finally and, and irrevocably and inevitably saved. So Calvin diverged from the tradition that came before him. He even diverged from what other Reformation leaders taught. But then after him, the Baptists, most of them, I'm free will Baptist, but most of the Baptists diverge with him from the Christian tradition. The Reformed Presbyterian tradition diverges with Calvin from the mainstream Christian tradition. But then when you look at the rest of Christianity today, they don't believe in once saved, always saved, or the certain perseverance of the saints. The majority of Christians uh, in America or elsewhere don't affirm the idea of eternal security. That's just not part of their DNA. The whole Methodist denomination, I mean, the second largest Protestant denomination in America is the United Methodist Church. You have the Restoration Movement, like Christian churches, Church of Christ, they're not Calvinist. And then the Pentecostal charismatic circles, we would largely hold to the idea of, of you can forfeit your salvation. The Anabaptist movement almost uh, uniformly believes that it's possible for a true believer to uh, apostatize from the faith. It would be an odd thing to accuse uh, Lutherans even, or Episcopalians of being Calvinists. So the vast majority of Christians uh, do not believe in once saved, always saved. This has never meant total perfection or sinlessness. It is The vast majority of people in the Christian faith do not believe in one saved, always saved. Okay. Do you know that the vast majority of the world does not believe in Jesus Christ? There are one point something billion Christians in the world. There are 8 billion people in the world. So an eighth of the entire world's population, or, or, yeah, an eighth is, is the only part that believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that Christianity is the only religion. Why are you not going with what the majority says in that regard? I mean, if you want to go with what the majority says, you're going to be wrong <laughs> a lot of times. So just because, again, the majority believes something means nothing. Let's go to the Bible. Okay. In, in fact, in the early church, right when, um, the early church be began in Jerusalem, the majority of Christians were Jewish people. In fact, it wasn't until Acts 10 that Cornelius and his household became Christians. So if the, and you know, that was on, it wasn't until later that they came to understand that the Jewish practices could not add to the salvation that we have in Christ. So for a time, at least for a season, the majority of Christians in the world at that time believed that you needed to do certain works and you needed to be going to the temple or the synagogue or um, doing some animal sacrifices, even though you believed. Was that majority correct? OK, so like I'm not even going to spend so much time on this just because the majority says something doesn't mean it's correct now. Statistically, or according to official statistics, the majority of Americans voted for a certain president in 2020. But some of these people in these churches, in these evangelical circles, deny those election results. So they're willing, when it benefits them, to say, no, the majority is wrong or, or the majority didn't get it right. The majority of people in the country said this man is the right person to lead the country, but you think they're wrong. But suddenly, when it benefits your argument, because the majority of Christians believe something, they are right, doesn't make sense. Um, Calvinism says, uh, he said he also believed in the gift of perseverance. Again, believing it, like he got certain things wrong. So taking the entirety of someone's doctrine and uh, uh, tying it to what is being taught today, I understand the need for looking at history and stuff, but as we've seen, the fact that someone lived earlier than us doesn't mean that they were right, okay? So just because Martin Luther believed in perseverance of, uh, what is it called? The gift of perseverance that the elect will persevere to the end, and Calvin came and tweaked that, or in their words, in their eyes, tweaked that, 
again, doesn't mean anything. What is the Bible actually teaching? If you're going to go with what people said in the past, how do you know when someone is right or wrong? Do you go to what other people said or do you go to the Bible? When there were heretics and there were false doctrines creeping up in the church, in the, in the early church, how did they know what was right from what was wrong? They went to the Bible. So when you look at what one person said, and instead of going to the scripture, which I'm sure they're going to go to the scriptures, um, but at least when they're talking about the early church, instead of comparing what they're saying to the scriptures, they're comparing what they said, what they said with what other people that they agree with also said. Um, even some Messianic Jews believe in eternal security. Um, welcome, welcome, brother. And Michelle, welcome as well. And Hubert as well, welcome. So let's keep going. They Now they're asking, are we teaching sinless perfection? So let's see what that's about. It has always meant faithfulness. Every one of us, every single day, falls short of the holiness of God. And every day we live by grace and by mercy and by the cleansing blood of Jesus. Jesus. That's the foundation. The possibility of sin exists until Christ comes and we are transformed into his image. 1 John 2, 1 is the answer to that. If anyone sins, it immediately says there is a possibility that you'll sin, but then you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you sin, you can go before the throne of grace boldly. It's a difference between falling in dirt and rolling in dirt. I've stumbled in the 30 years I've walked with God, but the Spirit of God had me to get up and get up quick. If I slip up, I'm careless perhaps sometime, I immediately my conscience convicts me. I say, Lord, please forgive me. But I take that sin more seriously because I don't want to hurt my Lord. Recognizing that believers will fail as the followers of Jesus failed in the Gospels themselves is a crucial understanding of the Christian life. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness and a steady growth. Do you expect your child to remain the same level, physically, intellectually, in every way, always doing the same foolish things? We want our child to grow. You'd be disappointed if your child is not growing emotionally, intellectually, physically, in every way. This is how the Christian life is, from glory to glory. That is God's will for us. All right. Um... I don't see how this is against one saved, always saved. I actually agree with a lot of the things that he said. Um, I think they're presented it as if you're preaching one saved, always saved, you are kind of negating that a Christian will sin. Um, no, again, no authentic grace preacher. I wish they had some grace preachers in this, but no authentic grace preacher says you won't sin. A grace preacher says you will sin. <laughs> and if you do sin, it doesn't change who you are. In fact, the reason you should not sin is because of your understanding of who you are. Just like the reason you should not go drink out of a toilet is because you understand that you're a human. You're not a dog. You don't do that. So, I mean, I don't understand how this is against the teaching of eternal security. So after stating that they sin every day, that they fall short every day, um, which is really like Romans 3.23, the solution to falling short and falling short of the glory of God is to be justified by faith in Jesus. That's Romans 3.24. So, I mean, sure, let's go what they said. Um, they're admitting these things and yet they're angry that God has secured them. I mean, if, I mean, I used to I used to be on the same wavelength, but now that I see it, it's like it's baffling how you can admit that you sin, you still sin. Okay, when you sin, you repent, of course. But listen, if you if if salvation is not secure, it doesn't matter if you repent or not. If you the moment you sinned the first time after you got saved, you're lost. That's it. Because Jesus is the one who died to pay for your sin. Um, he would have to die again to cover or remove that other sin if his one time death was not enough. So you repenting means nothing in the context of what did it take for you to be forgiven? The reason you can go to God and receive forgiveness is because you've already believed in Christ. So you can say that in one breath that I sin, I make mistakes, I mess up. And I remember that, Hey, I'm, I need to repent. And um, in the next breath, you're angry that God has secured you. If he didn't secure you, where would you be? I mean, he says, um, one, one person said when he sins, he repents or the Holy Spirit convicts him and he repents and he takes that sin more seriously. Now, I don't know this man and I'm not going to assume that I know him, 
But the way Christians classify sins, because of that fact that we classify certain sins as big and small, I know for a fact it's not every sin that he takes more seriously after he has committed it. Think about a white lie, like a lie that's kind of true, or information that you omit when you know it would lead to you being found out or something, or gossiping, talking about someone, or even envying, or getting angry and uh, it putting negative thoughts in your mind towards somebody, or calling someone a fool, or judging someone based on what you see, or anything, like Paul says, anything that is not of faith, anything that is not based on your faith in Christ is sin. Okay, do you know how many sins that, how many things that covers as sin? You can't say that you take every sin or once you repent, you take it more seriously because you could never even survive that load, that mental load. There's no way anyone on earth has ever confessed every single sin because there are sins you don't even know you've committed. But then they would make the argument that, well, yeah, God knows you don't know that you've committed or that you've forgotten and so he'll forgive you. Uh, no, if God is going to judge you for not confessing the sins that you've committed, he is going to judge you. He's not going to make an excuse because you forgot. Don't forget that God is a righteous judge. He's the righteous judge. So it's like contradictions. My friend Matt McMillan would say they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They, It's double talk. It's you're admitting that you you still sin, but then you're saying that God is not the one who secures you. So I want, I'm want i interested in this part two, which says biblical arguments. And I will let it play for a little longer um, and just tackle the key, key points briefly so we don't spend too long here. Okay, so let's go. Did you know that there are over 80 passages in the New Testament that warn Christians not to lose what they've got in Christ, 80. And most of them are ignored or overlooked or not preached about, but they're serious. You have many, many warnings in the New Testament about the possibility of apostasy. It's consistent through the Gospels, the Epistles. It's consistent through, through the whole Bible. In his book, Major Bible Themes, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, a strong advocate of once saved, always saved, he makes this statement, as many as 85 passages are listed by those holding the Arminian view as establishing the doctrine of conditional security. So he acknowledges the great weight of scripture behind conditional security. We have warning passages in James and Peter and John. It's very difficult to think of any New Testament document that doesn't refute once saved, always saved. Okay. Uh, before they even get into that, every time they read, I, I think they're about to get into scripture after scripture. So we, we can take it one at a time. But every time they read something, think about context. Let this one word be in your mind, the entire part two, as they're going through their biblical arguments. If you can pull up a Bible, because we're going through this together. If you can pull up a Bible, pull up a Bible. Um, if you can't, it's okay. We'll go through it as well. And just keep the word context in mind. So if there are, yeah, conditional security. So if there are 85 passages that really teach against once saved, always saved, then they should teach against once saved, always saved when applied in the right context. Okay. So if not, then you're making the Bible say something it's not saying. So uh, keep the word, keep the word context in your mind, not conditional security, but the word context. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, I think you have one of the clearest passages in all the entire Bible that uh, you could forfeit your salvation because nobody's going to doubt the Apostle Paul saved. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Disqualified, put out of the race. Not a question of coming in second or third. Disqualified. 
It's amazing because he uses that word adakamas elsewhere when talking to the Corinthians or writing to the Corinthians. And he states in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he warns in verse 21 of those who have not yet repented of their, their sexual immorality, their, their sin and so forth. And he warns them that they must, you know, examine themselves. In chapter 13, verse 5, he says, examine yourselves, uh, test yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith, unless you are Adakamas. He used the same exact Greek word. He defines Adakamas as being without Christ, as not being in the faith anymore. Now, he's the great apostle Paul who's been taken up to the third heaven and planted churches, written scripture. What does he say about himself? If ever there was a person who des deserved to go to heaven because he served the Lord, it's Paul. But he says, I discipline my body, verse 27. If Paul lives with the feeling that it could be distantly possible that I would be put out of this race. How can we say, no, you can't be put out of the race, no matter what you do. And then he goes on to say, I'll give you some examples. Ignore the chapter division. In chapter 10, he says, remember the people who came out of Egypt, baptized into Moses in the Red Sea and all that? Nevertheless, verse 5, with most of them, God was not well pleased and they were perished in the wilderness. He's connecting to that with what he just said, that I could be disqualified. And verse 11, these things are happened to them as an example and were written for our instruction. Here's the important thing. The one who thinks he stands, let him be careful, lest he does not fall. Okay, so there's a lot in there as far as context and stuff. Okay, so when Paul says, he's running so that he will not be disqualified. One of the problems that people run into when misinterpreting scripture, or I guess it's not a problem, it's a problem what they run into when interpreting scripture that makes them misinterpret scripture, is the wrong application, the wrong analogy. Okay, when Paul is talking about running a race like an athlete, where is salvation described as running a race? Where is the act of believing in Jesus. Okay, Romans chapter 10. If you believe in your heart that God raises, or if you confess with your mouth the, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has risen from the dead, you will be saved. Like what about that signifies a race? Okay, salvation is presented all throughout scripture as believe and it's done. John 3, 16, John 3, 36. If you believe in the son, you will have eternal life. John chapter 10. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Why? Because they follow me. And how, what does it mean to follow Jesus? To believe. John chapter 6, verse 40. Um, I wonder if they're going to bring all these scriptures up. But John chapter 6, verse 40. Um, this is the, the work of God that you believe in He whom he has sent. Or this is the will of the Father that you believe in him who he has sent. Everything ties back to believing when it comes to salvation. So if Paul is talking about a race all of a sudden, you can't just tie it to salvation. When you're arguing something, you can't jump to a conclusion. You have to present your argument as to why this passage is talking about salvation. Okay. If, and he said, if you don't um, examine yourself, you, you might find that you have believed in vain. Okay. You might be disqualified. Is that talking about like, is that talking about what happens after salvation or is that talking about salvation itself? I would argue, of course, that's talking about what happens after salvation. Paul is running a race. He is on a mission, okay? And he's telling others about the goodness of God. He's telling others about the, the, the grace and peace that is in Christ when you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And he's saying that I am running this race, but I don't want to preach to other people and then find myself wanting in those same things that I'm preaching, the, the, the works that come out of an identity. The People argue that... Um, the rewards, the heavenly rewards that he would receive, he doesn't want to be disqualified from that. And when you look at where he's drawing this analogy from, it's from, he's writing to Greek people. So he's using a Greek race, okay, where they would lay the disqualified people on the side because they couldn't finish the race. And if at any point Paul was likening this to losing salvation, then why would he also in other letters talk about how there is a crown of righteousness that's laid before him. Why would he talk about the fact that he has finished the race if there's no way to know you finished the race until you've died? Why would he say that uh, to live is Christ, to die is gain? I want to die so I can be with Christ, but it's more beneficial for you that I live. These don't sound like the words of someone who is unsure that he's, he's saved or not. These, these sounds like 
these sound like the words of someone who knows that he's saved, but in his daily life, he recognizes the need to live like he is saved. Okay. And uh, Romans 11 verse 22. Okay. Let's see. Let's get some comments real quick. Oh yeah. So he talked about how some people, um, he used the example of the people in the wilderness. If you go look at the context and please take note of these passages, we can't go through everything. But if you look at the context, he's talking about the fact that they didn't believe. He's talking about the fact that they couldn't enter the rest of God because they didn't believe in him. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he wanted them to receive a covenant based on faith. Why? Because his covenant with Abraham was based on faith. So his descendants were supposed to enter the promised land based on the fact that God promised and we believe. But instead, what did they do? They said, God, you talk to just Moses. Tell us what you want us to do, and we will do it. And if we don't do it, then let the punishment come upon us. That, that's why they didn't enter into his rest. That's why they are an example to us that we believe, that we trust in what God has said. It's not an example that they were saved and then they lost salvation. No, they had the opportunity to enter into God's rest through faith, but they rejected it and asked for works instead. I think that sounds familiar, but let's let's move on. Uh, or let me see what did. Um, what is the point of a circumcised heart? Okay, Denise, we're saved by grace through faith. Someone can deny the blood of Jesus after one point in their life, believing in it for salvation, still are saved. Um, yeah, if if we, I'm sure they'll, they'll get to that. But here's the thing: someone can say that I no longer believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Someone can say that I no longer. Um, I'm no longer a Christian. Someone can say that, but the question is, does that change who they've already become in their spirit, in their identity? Does that, does that rip the seal of the Holy Spirit away from them? Does that destroy the DNA of God, the spiritual DNA? I use DNA in quotes because it's not actual DNA. The Bible says it's the seed of God. Peter writes and says that, um, it is the incorruptible seed of God in us, which means nothing can ever change it. Nothing can ever corrupt it. Nothing can ever taint it, including sin, including what they call apostasy, which is saying that I no longer believe. If someone truly believe and they say they never, they don't believe anymore, it doesn't change the seed of God in them. Not because they did anything special, but because the seed of God is incorruptible. Again, what you will find is, Grace preachers always put the work on God. They always, they always trust in God's capabilities over our own. Okay. Whereas those who are against the gospel of grace or against one saved, always saved, look to man, look to what you should be doing, which is, is so ironic. They're talking about the Israelites not being able to enter into God's rest. But the reason they couldn't enter into his rest was because they asked for works instead of believing but they are saying that believing is not enough, so you need to do work. So they are kind of acting like the Israelites, but the Israelites are our examples. I mean, the contradictions, man, they're, they're everywhere, but we're not even halfway through. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. In Romans chapter 11, Paul makes very clear declarations that you can absolutely forfeit your salvation. Paul is giving a, a warning to believers that just as uh, Israel, we see, was, was cut off and the Gentiles were, were grafted in, it says we should not have any uh, reason to be boastful because it says we could also be cut off. But let me tell you, he says, you're only going to continue to be grafted in if you continue to trust, if you continue to live in his goodness. If you don't, you'll be cut off just like they were. I don't see how you could state it any more clearly. I'll tell you how. <laughs> the Isra this passage is about the people of Israel versus Gentiles. He said it. He said it himself. It's not about an individual Israelite and an individual Gentile. It's about how God grafts people in. Again, the argument here is salvation by grace through faith. The Israelites did not believe the Gentiles. We were extended or the invitation was extended to us so that we may enter into this covenant that's between Jesus, 
and the Father by faith or through faith. That's that's what Romans 11 is talking about here. Okay, it's not saying you, the individual, if you don't continue, you will be cut off. It's saying if the Gentiles were to take the plate or to learn from the Israelites in the wrong way and say, we don't want to believe by faith. We want laws. We want works. Give us what we should do and we'll do it. Then the Gentiles would also be cut off. And he said it himself that this is contrasting Israel versus Gentiles. And then all of a sudden he makes it about an individual. That's not how context works. Remember, we said we're going to keep the word context in mind. That's not how it works. I, I don't think I'm going to comment more on this because if there's anyone else, they'll probably say most of the same thing. So we'll just let the next scripture come along. But we'll Look carefully at the kindness and the severity of God to those who fell severity. He's talking about the Jewish people. But to you, kindness, if, there's a big if, if you continue in his kindness, why does the Bible use the word if? It should, if it's once saved, always saved, it should say, you know, when. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's a, it's a guaranteed thing. He says, don't be high-minded or conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. The problem uh, for the once saved, always saved crowd with this verse is that they say it's impossible to fall away. And if it's impossible to, to fall away, then uh, there's no reason to fear at all. Some once saved, always saved people are saved. Hold on. Did you see that word right there? You see that word unbelief? They just zoomed into it. They were broken off for their unbelief not for their sin well unbelief is sin but not for fornication not for lying cheating stealing adultery not for any of that those things are, are not good they're not okay but they were broken up for their unbelief so you gentiles make sure that if god did not spare the israelites who were descendants of abraham if he did not spare them because they did not believe you better make sure that you believe in jesus like that's all it's saying <laughs> it's not saying that you have believed so once you always say it's talking about someone who's already believed, obviously. So it's not saying you have believed, but you should be afraid because you will also be cut off. No, it's saying if you don't believe. The, the, the man said he doesn't know how much clearer it could be, but I don't know how much clearer it could be when it says unbelief right there. And they, they just zoomed into that verse. Dude, will he spare you? The problem uh, for the once saved, always saved crowd with this. People are saying, well, Paul's just kind of warning the Gentiles corporately. He's just warning Gentiles that they need to recognize the Jewish position and so forth. Uh, they're trying to divert you. I'm sorry. Look at what the text actually says. He's not talking to Gentiles generally. He's Fam, did they not just say that he was talking to Gentiles versus Israelites? They just said that themselves. I know I'm not tripping. They just said that. But suddenly, because it goes against their argument, all of a sudden, that's not what it says. Okay. Warning those who stand by their faith. You don't tell somebody at your work that, or, or a neighbor that doesn't know Jesus, that they stand in Christ by their faith and they need to keep the faith or be cut off. That makes no sense at all. You've been grafted into this wonderful olive tree, but if you are not faithful, we'll cut you off as well. So faithfulness is a requirement. And I encourage the, the, anybody who's listening to this, look at what the text says. Quit trying to explain it away in view of a theology that you want to uphold. Uphold the word of God and change your Moment of silence for what he just said. Look at what the scripture actually says. Don't look at it in the light of a theology you want to uphold. You're saying this in a documentary about a theological position you want to uphold. You're not looking at the word based on what it's saying. You're looking at the word based on what you want it to say. Another moment of silence. We can go on. <laughs> Change your theology. Ooh, Hebrews 6. Let's go. Hebrews has uh, at least a dozen passages that refute once saved, always saved. Chapter six and 10 seem to just say bluntly, you can lose your salvation. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6 is another, I believe, just 
categorically clear passage uh, that teaches that people can once be saved and actually forfeit salvation. There are three popular responses by proponents of eternal security to the warning passages. The first is, these are not true believers that are being addressed. The second is, these texts are not talking about the loss of salvation, they're talking about the loss of rewards. The third is, God is using these warnings to get believers to persevere, even though He knows they cannot help but persevere. The book of Hebrews is very clearly written to Christians. That's, that's clear on every single page of the book of Hebrews. It's very difficult to say that one who has been enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and made a partaker of the Holy Spirit and has been sanctified by the blood of Christ and is a brother, it's hard to say that those people have never been genuinely converted. I don't think there's any way around this being an apostasy text because even though the word is tasted is used it means really experienced i mean it says in the same book that christ tasted death well that didn't mean he had a little bit of taste of death it means he died when it says they receive the holy spirit the greek word that is used there is the same word that's used in hebrews 3 1 of holy brethren who had received the heavenly calling did they receive the heavenly calling or not you know hebrews 6 4 had been enlightened tasted of the heavenly gift that's definitely born again and made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the world can't receive the Holy Spirit. Paul said the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Holy Spirit. Yet these folks had received the Holy Spirit. It says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Again to repentance? Again means they had repented initially. Even to right to the end in Hebrews 13, where he talks about the regular practice of the Christian faith that they are doing in Rome. So no, he's not writing to non-Christians. Verse six, having fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. The idea that we could be beyond retrieval reminds us of Proverbs 29. Someone can be rebuked and uh, stiff-necked after so many rebukes he can get to the point where he's broken beyond the possibility of change that's a scary passage and every the, day that you uh, sin is a day that you are getting closer and closer to that point of reprobation you can't keep on living in a wait but these are the same people who said they sin every day right so every day they sin they're getting closer and closer to reprobation okay but they are the same ones who admitted in the same documentary that they also sin. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll talk about everything they're saying in a second. In a way that hurts him, that crucifies him again. You can't do that. Think about it this way. Every sin is a sin for which Jesus had to die. How could you ever take a laissez-faire view of your sin once you knew that? You helped crucify Christ. And that's why in Hebrews we hear about the apostate re-crucifying Christ by the sins that they were committing of rejecting and turning away from Christ. That's it right there. Oh, next is Hebrews 10. Okay, these are two of my favorite passages. You see, Hebrews used to confuse me. Sorry, let me make myself right here. All right. Hebrews also used to confuse me um, until I realized something. I realized that Hebrews only makes sense when you make the new covenant a big deal. Hebrews only makes sense when you trust completely in what Jesus has done. If not, it's like, what's going on here? Okay, so let's take it one by one. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. Let me pull it up because this is, um, yeah, we're going to dive into this one a little bit. Hebrews 6. Um, share this tab. This one bigger. Okay, cool. Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. I'm used to it being on this side. Cool. All right. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, I, I said a few minutes ago that you can't just come up with conclusions. You have to prove your reasoning behind certain conclusions. So they spent a lot of time trying to show how this is a Christian, like this is describing a Christian. If you've tasted a good word of God and the powers of the age to come, yada, yada, you're a Christian. Cool, I agree with that. What they didn't prove is that this is talking about apostasy. They came to the conclusion, they said, this is referring to an apostate, and how can you be an apostate if you're not a Christian? This is talking about a Christian. But you never showed us 
why you believe this is an apostate. Is it because of the word fall away? Okay. Now let's go to those those words fall away. Number one, who is Hebrews written to? They said it's undoubtedly undoubtedly written to um, Christians. Cool, that's true. But these are Jewish Christians. These are not just Gentile Christians. These are Christians who grew up with the law. These are Christians who attended synagogues and went to the temple and were offering sacrifices and were uh, uh, trying to atone for their sins with the blood of bulls and goats. I told you we should keep the word context in mind. Context can relate to a verse. It can relate to a passage. It can relate to the entire book. And of course, it can relate to even entire sections of the Bible. So the context of Hebrews is that the writer is making an argument, or he's making several arguments, proving why Jesus Christ is higher than angels. That's in chapter one. He is a better um, high priest than Melchizedek. He is a better priest than Levi. He is um, a better sacrifice than that of bulls and goats. Why does the author of Hebrews feel the need to be making these arguments? It's because the people he or he or she, no one knows the writer, is writing to, um, is the people that they're writing to are, are trying to supplement the work of Christ. They don't fully understand how much Jesus, the Messiah, is higher, how much higher he is than these things that they've placed their faith in because they're Jewish people. They've heard about angels visiting their prophets. Oh, yeah. It also makes an argument that Jesus is higher than the prophets and higher than, and because of Christ, we receive better things than the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, than David, than Daniel. He's making all these arguments because these are people who are familiar with those passages in the Old Testament. So that brings us to chapter six. Um, and even they're about to get to chapter 10. So I'll get, I'll talk about this more. But in chapter six, it says in the beginning, right? chapter six, verse one, let's leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ and go on to perfection, not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and baptism, laying on of hands, eternal judgment, resurrection. Okay. And this we will do if God permits context is important. He said, we will move on from the elementary discussions if God permits, which means we're still on the elementary discussions. Why? For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and we just read that that passage. Okay, let's let's simplify the the whole description of a Christian. It is impossible for a Christian if you know how they pointed out the word if in Romans eleven. Romans eleven, they pointed out how if it, it, the word if being there means that it's possible to lose salvation when it's not really talking about. Uh, an individual, but they skipped over the word if here. Okay. Again, the more you watch things like this and hear arguments, these are not new arguments. The more you see this discrepancy and contradictions, there's a, there's an if here as well. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Okay. If they fall away, doesn't mean it's possible to fall away. That whole sentence is important. If they fall away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance. Why? Because they crucify the son of God again. In other words, if you were to lose your salvation, it would be impossible to repent. Why? Because you would be crucifying Christ again. Why? Because your repentance, the repentance that saved you was to change your mind from unbelief to belief in Jesus why? Because he is the son of God. That's what you believed in, that he's the son of God. So if you were to fall away, if you were to, excuse me, if you were to lose your salvation, it would be impossible to repent because Jesus will never die again. I won't take my time. Oh, getting a little heated. Aren't these the same people who just said they repent all the time after they've sinned? If, if sin the only thing that could cause you to lose your salvation is sin. I mean, unbelief is sin. Falling away is because of sin. Number one, they admitted that they sin. They said they repent. But this verse is saying, if you were to lose your salvation, it would be impossible to repent. Something is not adding up. Okay, so what this is presenting is the extent to which we cannot lose our salvation. It's how secure our salvation is. We are so secure that 
it like if it were possible that's why the word if is there if we were to lose our salvation it would be impossible to come back you can't just sin and you've lost your salvation and then you just say oh like the person said oh god i'm sorry forgive me and i take the sin more seriously and now you're saved again that's not how it works jesus died okay and they're saying it with a lot of emotion oh you're crucifying the son but that's what you're doing by your unbelief this this entire hebrews chapter and in fact the whole book talks about faith if we, we'll go to the the bottom of the chapter in a second but i want to point out um verse nine after he has described falling away and how how much it would take to be restored and that jesus would have to die again for you to be restored to faith or to, for your salvation to be restored he says in verse nine but beloved we are confident of better things concerning you yes things that accompany salvation though we speak in this manner so even though I'm saying all these things that if you were to fall away, it would be impossible to bring you back to repentance. I'm not even concerned about that. I'm confident of better things for you. Like, I know you're not going to fall away, even though I'm speaking like this. Okay. In a word, this is hypothetical. And so he, the other person presented um, the cases or the arguments of some Christians or some people who believe in one saved always say that, oh, number one, it's not talking to Christians. I believe it's talking to Christians. Uh, number two. Uh, it's not talking about uh, salvation. It's not talking about losing salvation. It's talking about losing rewards. I don't see that. And the third one was that it's talking about persevering. I don't see that either. I see a hypothetical situation where if you were to lose your salvation, you could never come back. And that would mean that you're lost. And that would mean that eternal security is a lie. And that would mean that no one is saved because we've all sinned after being saved. And yet we believe that we're Christians. And these same people have said it too, that they've sinned, but they can after saying that, they can read a verse like this and not think, hmm. Okay, let's go to the end of this chapter. Um, oh, no, I believe that's in that's in chapter 10. Okay, so we'll, we'll watch this next part and then go to chapter 10. What are you guys saying over here? They never point to anywhere in scripture that the level, what the level of faithfulness is. Yeah, there, there's never an objective. Oh, if you're faithful up to this level, then you're saved. Then you know you're saved. No, there's never anything objective. They point to themselves that, oh, I've been in ministry for this many years. And, you know, that's how I know I'm faithful. But you've sinned every, probably every day of those years, if you're looking at the law of Moses and think, and sins that you don't remember. Um yeah, you can't you can't understand Hebrews if you don't understand the shadow because Hebrews is not just to any regular Christians, not to the Corinthian church who did not know anything about Jewish custom or laws. This is this is written to to people who were so confident in Old Testament sacrifices. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at chapter ten. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? The author of Hebrews, who is certainly saved, includes himself in the warning. He says, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. He talks about how they've trampled underfoot the blood of Christ by which they were sanctified. And, you know, some say, well, they were sanctified. They just kind of went to church. Well, no, the, the book of Hebrews, and especially chapter 10, even earlier, uses sanctification in the context of salvation. And also it's in the passive voice. It's not something they did. God sanctified them by the blood of Christ. This person was once sanctified so now god is the one who sanctified them this is now so what about what you said earlier about how god is not the one who does the work but we are the one who is supposed to be doing things to quote unquote sanctify ourselves i mean the contradictions by the blood of Jesus and now has trampled it underfoot. Some proponents of eternal security say that God is just using the warning passages as a means of perseverance, a means to get people to persevere, even though he knows that he's going to make them persevere. Well, the problem with that is that that's not quite honest. Oh, that's if I am a teacher and I have already decided in advance that all my students are going to pass the course, 
And if I say you must study or else you will make an F in this course, that is disingenuous. If they were predetermined not to be saved from before the foundation of the universe, then there's no point in warning them about apostasy because they couldn't do otherwise. No, these are real warnings to real Christians because there really is real spiritual danger for them. And he says, if people disobeyed the law of Moses, died without mercy, without with two or three witnesses bearing witness to them, how much severer the punishment will be for those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God and treated the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as unclean and has insulted the Holy Spirit. It's an a fortiori argument. If the Old Testament people of God could lose their salvation, given the greater privilege we have in the gospel, how much more severely would... No, how much less can we lose our salvation when we have a greater promise? I mean, I feel like this is backwards thinking. The... We have been given a better covenant. Hebrews, the same book of Hebrews that you're taking out of context right now, says that we've been given a better covenant. What does better mean? Jesus said that his burden is, his yoke is light and his burden is easy. John reiterates this and says that his commandments are not burdensome. Because the commandments of Jesus are to believe in him and to love one another as he has loved us. It's not 613 commandments in the law. So this is backwards thinking. You can't say the Old Testament uh, people were saved uh, and they trampled if they were worthy of punishment for trampling the law. How much like how much more us like we're going to look at the context and everything that you're saying. But I just want to insert these little notes um, because we can't get to everything in detail. But I want to look at this chapter in detail. So. They would God deal with us? You get this greater to lesser again, which we've been seeing over and over again throughout uh, the warnings in the New Testament that we're not to say, well, we're not under the law, so therefore we can commit apostasy over and over again in Hebrews chapter no, 2, Hebrews chapter you. 10, Hebrews chapter 12. It's even worse to fall away under grace. So this text rules out the loss of rewards view because it says that the one who turns from Christ can only expect a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That is not the loss of rewards. Verses like this would put the fear of God into my heart, even as a Christian, uh, that I have a, an obligation and a, and a responsibility towards God as a Christian. There comes a time when the heart can be hardened, the heart becomes unwarmable, and the will becomes unwilling because of a persistent pattern of sin that allows us to drift away from the dock of Christ in his salvation. Most Arminians believe that sin can directly cause apostasy. However, Reformed Arminians like myself believe that sin hardens your heart. It doesn't lead directly to apostasy, but it can lead to a hardening of the heart whereby you harden your heart against the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then that union with Christ that comes by faith alone can be broken and you can commit apostasy. And that when you do that, it's irremediable. I tend to believe that those who are worried about whether they have committed the sin of apostasy are safe. Well, who is it saying it's impossible to renew again in repentance? But you just said no one is safe until we die. I mean, I don't know if he specifically said it, but this is what this is the argument of the entire group. So now you decide who's safe based on whether they feel like they've committed apostasy or not. Not everybody that falls away. The scriptures are very clear that branches were broken off. Romans 11 can be grafted back in again. James chapter 5, that if you bring one who is turned from the truth back, you'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. The prodigal son came back and he was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. That's all over the scripture. I think the ISV brings it out really, really well because it brings out the present tense participle so long as they continue to crucify the Son of God afresh. If people are hell bent on hell, and rejecting Jesus. Yeah, the author of Hebrews warns, you can harden your heart so much in chapter three where you can fall away from the living God and you don't hear his voice. But that doesn't mean his voice wasn't there. It is there, but- This is all about people who don't believe. This is not about a Christian. If you, if like, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Like this is someone who's not saved, who is like not believing. This is not a believer who is falling away or losing salvation. 
but it's you tuning out his voice. If we find in ourselves a numb heart, a cold heart, a desire not to obey, we should take heed to these warning passages and turn our hearts toward God until we hear the voice of God again. Okay. I'm really trying to calm myself down. Um, someone warned me when I when I announced that I was going to do this live stream. Someone said it was hard to sit through because of just the what they described as arrogance and double talk and experiential knowledge, things based on anecdotal evidence or their own experience. And I agree. <laughs> I agree. Let's look at Hebrews 10. Um, okay. We've discussed the, the context of Hebrews chapter Hebrews um, in general and Hebrews chapter 6. So in Hebrews chapter 10, before we even get to Hebrews chapter 10, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Oh, sorry, y'all can't see this. Um, all right. Wait, no. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, let me just summarize it. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 are talking about the sacrifices of the Old Testament and how they were not enough. So let's look at certain key verses. Um, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. This is going to come into play in chapter 10, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the purifying of the flesh, it's talking about Old Testament purification. How much more, not how much less, like the other person said, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, this is why he's a mediator of the new covenant. Um, let's see, let's see. Okay, so there was no covenant without a shedding of blood and almost all things are purified with blood and without a shedding of blood without shedding of blood there is no remission there is no forgiveness if blood is not shed this is god's law this will come into play in chapter 10 as well uh let's see okay okay and as it is appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment so christ was offered again you see the word once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Okay. Now let's go to chapter 10. So this is all about the Old Testament sacrifices. <clears throat> for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then they would have they would have stopped offering these sacrifices if it could make them perfect they would have just stopped because it made them perfect but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year just by offering the sacrifice you're reminded that you're a sinner why because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins okay but if you read first john it says um for this reason the son of god was manifest that was manifested that he will take away the sins of the world or that he'll take away sin. Um, but it says the booze and goods could not take it away. They could only atone. They could only cover. They could just put a film of blood over your sin so that God would not judge you for your sin. But Jesus actually removes your sin. Like it says, as far as the East is from the West. So that is how far he has taken our sin away from us. So there's a difference between atoning for sin and or covering sin and removing sin jesus removes sin so if you're a believer jesus has removed your sins every single sin when you when you, if the sins you commit next week were in the future when jesus died so he didn't just remove your past sins they're only passed to you to us those who are in time they're passed to us but to jesus is the same moment i took away all sins for all eternity period that's it it's done it's finished okay Let's summarize a few more chapters and we'll get to what they said. Um, in verse 10, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Again, you see the word once for all. This word keeps coming back. Okay. 
But this man, after he, uh, the priest would go in daily and, of course, every year. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered, again, one sacrifice for our sins forever, forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Okay. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I mean, we're not even looking for the word one or once in Scripture. We're literally just reading what the, what the Bible is saying. And this is what it's telling us. Okay. Then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. So God doesn't even remember your sins. And he repeats, now where there is a mission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Why? Because that with the shedding of blood, there's forgiveness. So if you've been forgiven, there's no other offering. This is almost the same as Hebrews 10, 26. There's no other offering because you've been forgiven. Okay. Um. Okay, cool. Forsaking the assembly of ourselves, that's not what we're talking about today. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 26. I'm glad you all are still with me. Okay. For if we willfully, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Okay, let's take this little by little. Remember that everything the author has talked about so far, at least in the previous two to three chapters, has been about sin being covered versus being removed. Okay, and Again, this is the letter of Hebrews. It's written to Jewish people who understand the law. They understand the sacrifices. So they understand that when they sinned, all they had to do was go offer a sacrifice. Whenever they made a mistake, all they had to do was go and repent by offering a sacrifice. Okay. But this author is making the argument that Jesus Christ only died once. There is no other time that he's going to die. There's no other sacrifice that he's going to make. You can't go and repeatedly offer Jesus Christ because you sinned. That's if if we could lose our salvation, that is in all honesty what it would take. OK, so when he talks about willfully sinning, he's not talking about a believer who like um, uh, sins with fornication or whatever we classify as big sins. This is, again, going back to rejection of Jesus. If you reject Jesus, there is no other sacrifice. Why? Because there is only a fearful expectation of judgment. You expect to be judged. You're sinning. You're 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 living in unbelief. Even though you are saved, you are not trusting in the in the complete work of Jesus. You are not trusting in the sacrifice that finished everything. You are trusting in the same Old Testament um, um, bulls and goats and their blood, which in chapter one says, or in chapter four says, it's not possible that their uh, verse four says that it's not possible for their their blood to take away sins. You are trusting in that. So of course you expect judgment. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be brought worthy, who has who be thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified to a believer, a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? How much worse punishment would a person who rejects Jesus be deserving of? It's not saying they will lose their salvation. It's saying if you were to reject Jesus, how much punishment do you think you would deserve? But it told us already that you have a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. You are not an adversary of God, even if even if you misunderstand the new covenant. If you've believed in Jesus, you're not an adversary of God. Jesus said that we are his friends now. Romans 5, 1 says that because we've been justified, we have peace with God. So God is not fighting with us. We are not the adversaries. The judgment that will be poured on them, you expect it to be poured on you, but it won't. Why? Because you have been sanctified. Because, like I said, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. This willful sin is not the sins that they will list off and rattle off. This willful sin is rejecting Jesus. If you reject, let's see, let's see. Um, I think it's at the end, at the end of chapter 10, it says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. So the contrast to every warning he just gave is that we are not those people, we believe. So what do you think this is talking about? Is it talking about unbelief versus faith? Or is it talking about you name it, fill in the blank, what type of sin you want to put in there. No, this is talking about belief versus unbelief. The entirety of Hebrews is about faith. Yes, only chapter 11 really drills in on faith, 
but that's that's nearing the conclusion of the book so he explains what he's been talking about this entire time it's it's been about faith it's been about believing in jesus that he is better than the old testament sacrifices he's better than angels prophets the high priest melchizedek levi every levite who's ever lived jesus is greater than all these things so you have to really take this out of context to um to butcher it like that and that's why i say hebrews only makes sense when you make the new covenant a big deal if i make the the sacrifice of jesus a big deal then of course i understand that there's no other sacrifice for sin but if i make sin a big deal then i think there's no other sacrifice for my sin i'm losing my salvation no the reason it's not a sacrifice is because jesus was offered once connecting minds to success you said earlier that you you haven't seen these arguments that you are presenting this argument of let me just see if i can find the list uh can't find it right now the list they talked about with like what people say this verse could mean that it, it might not be a christian and stuff like these are not arguments i've even heard any grace preacher use so they're creating their own straw man and argument arguing against it um let's go to where they're about to go okay this is peter so i think this is where we are Today, if you hear his voice, harden, harden not your heart is talking about an unsafe person, not a believer. A believer already. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10? My sheep hear my voice. Okay, so like this is not if you hear his voice. This is this is an unbeliever who is not saved. If you're Jesus' sheep, you hear his voice. Context, man. Context matters. Second Peter 2.20. Oh, y'all can't see this. Sorry. Oh, I need to take my time. <laughs> You take what time? Cool. Okay. Um, I think you're good now. Oh, friend of Deshaun, let me know your name, bro. Okay. Look at Second Peter chapter two. Here again is a strong statement about the possibility of a believer being lost. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Peter says it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned away. That is talking about someone forfeiting their salvation. It says the way of righteousness. What's the way of righteousness? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. The early church was called the way. These are people who left the faith. Now, some argue that this is only applying to the false teachers, not to their audience. Whoever it's speaking of, these are people who actually did come to the knowledge of the truth. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge, and we're not talking about intellectual knowledge, we're talking about intimate personal knowledge. And the Greek word he uses there is epigenosis. Uh, that's experiential knowledge. Many Calvinists will admit, and when they're commenting on Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, uh, has to do with salvation knowledge. Then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What is that but a person who has truly known salvation? The message of the true proverb has happened to them. A dog returns to its vomit. A sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. The Calvinist interpretation would be that if you've truly been washed, you could never go back to the mire, you could never go back to the mud, which itself seems to raise the question, well, why does Peter warn them? Peter is illustrating the lapsed state of a former believer, which he warns about in chapter 1, when he describes believers as having escaped the corruptions of the world through lust and forgetting that they were cleansed from their past sins. The pig is representative of a believer who has been cleansed and forgets he was even washed and goes back. So my question is, why doesn't that raise a question in their minds? If Peter already says that we believers have escaped the corruption of the world through lust, <clears throat> excuse me, 
why is he like, why doesn't that raise a question that this could be talking about something else? He's already clarified where we stand. Okay. He's already told us where we stand. So I like how he just brushed aside the fact that this is talking about false teachers. We'll look at that in a second, but he just said, oh, um, people say this is talking about false teachers. Well, either way you look at it, yada, yada, yada. No, no, no. If, if this is talking about false teachers, come on. You can at least admit that um, rather than brushing it aside. But okay, let's keep going. Uh, we'll finish this part and then continue with the breakdown. Back to the mud. I mean, I find it incredible that anyone could still teach once saved, always saved in light of that passage, which simply repeats what is said over and over. This guy just seems so angry to me. I don't know, no, no shade to him, but he just seems so against the thought that Christ could secure you. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Over in the New Testament. This is a passage for Christians. It was understood that way in the early church. And this is consistent with Jesus's teaching in the gospels and the apostolic teaching in the whole New Testament. How? You, you can't just say that. You can't just say that. Like. How is it consistent with Jesus' teachings? Is it when he was talking about the law? Is it, is it like, how is it consistent with what Jesus said? You can't just conclude that for us. You have to show us that Jesus said this. So um, let's go to this passage. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I think it's pretty clear what this is talking about. Okay. Deceptions of false teachers. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Second Peter 2, 12, depravity of false teachers. I mean, we're just looking at the topics here, I know, but Second Peter 2, for doom of false teachers. The beginning of the chapter, destructive doctrines. Okay. So every, if you just read the chapter, we can go through everything, but there were also false prophets among the people. Okay. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to reserve for judgment, did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness. So who is the opposite of a preacher of righteousness? A false teacher. It says, then God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment. This is not talking about a believer. It's talking to believers, but it's encouraging us that don't be worried too much about false teachers. Be on the lookout for them. Know what they sound and look like. But don't be worried because God knows how to preserve you, the true believer, and deal with the false teacher. And then it talks about how they twist the, the gospel. They have eyes full of adultery. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Okay, so they may know the gospel. Just because someone has heard the gospel doesn't mean that they are a true believer. Just because someone has taught or preached something related to the Bible doesn't mean they are a true believer. Only God knows whose heart is actually transformed, whose heart is actually saved. We, we, we can get it wrong sometimes. We can look at someone teaching and say, oh, they're a true believer. And then they leave and we're like, oh, well, you know, they've lost their salvation. When when God knows very well that they, they were never saved. That's why it's encouraging us that he knows how to separate the, the sheep from the goats. He knows how to judge between the just, those who've been made righteous through faith, from the unjust, those who just look like they've been made righteous or look like they're teaching the truth, but they're not. Okay, so you can't just brush aside the fact that this is talking about false teachers. Okay, so let's look at what they dealt with. For if after the, let me see, what is that right now? Yeah. For if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them, the pollutions of the world, and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a soul having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Another um, pitfall for a lot of these people we know this is about false teachers, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna play in their court for a second. Let's say, let's say this was talking about a believer. What tells you that this is a loss of salvation? This is all dealing with physical stuff. They are entangled with the pollutions of the world. But Peter also says that the seed that we've received from God is incorruptible. So you can be entangled in the pollutions of the world. You can go, you can, you can fall into stuff that you are it's not befitting of your identity as a Christian, right? And when I say you can, I'm not saying you are free to do so as in there, like there are no consequences. I mean, you, you, it's possible that you could do that. Um, but that doesn't change who you are. Okay. 
It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. They don't specify what that commandment is. And I'm not really sure, so I'm not even going to touch on that. But to 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 turn away from the holy commandment is not the same thing as to lose salvation. Maybe the holy commandment is to live in liberty. Maybe the holy commandment, because Peter gives instructions earlier on in the same book to add to your faith, your faith virtue and to add patience and add these things. And if you don't live according to that, does that change your identity? Does that make you lose your salvation? No, it doesn't. Yes, you've gone back to wallowing in the mire, but guess what? You are still saved. This is what that man in the blue shirt is so angry about, that how can we still preach that you're saved after you've wallowed in sin? But they are the same people who said they also sin. So how can they say that they don't depend on this grace to be eternally secure when they also admit it, when they also admit to sinning? I mean, you always have to point to someone else to prove this anti one saved, always saved doctrine. You have to point to someone else because the moment you look at yourself and just take a second and be like, hey, like for real, for real, I mess up. For real, for real, like I, some of my sins no one knows about. Like I've been messing up. I've been in ministry, but I've been engaged in some crazy stuff even while I was a believer. And if it, if not for God's grace, if not for the fact that Jesus Christ said it is finished, I would be lost. They don't look at that. You have to point to someone else and be like the, that Pharisee who's like, thank God I'm not like this sinner. The more you do that, the more the rest of your fingers are pointing to you and saying, well, look at yourself. You depend on God's grace and then you bite the hand that's feeding you by saying he didn't promise eternal security. A friend of mine said, to create a documentary to argue that God doesn't keep his children is wild. Yeah, it's wild to say the least. Let's keep going. Um, oh, Jude, right? Jude. Yeah, we can we can chat offline. Um, when just hit me up on Instagram, man. All right, let's let's go. I don't know if Instagram is offline, but I James off this stream. Okay. This is yet another incredibly clear passage about forfeiture of salvation, a strong warning. And James in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he says, Brethren, he's talking to brethren, genuine believers, and he says, Brethren, if any of you turn from the truth, in other words, they're in the truth, and one converts him back, he'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Now, some would say, well, James was written to Jewish believers, but also to Jewish seekers. But when we refer to them as brothers, it then says this, if one of you strays from the truth and another brings him back. So this is someone who is in the Lord. This is someone who is in the truth. And if it's any among you, in Greek, it's the exact same construction we have earlier. If there's anyone sick among you, this is someone in the body. They'll say, well, it's just talking about him, not really his soul. Uh, but you know what? The, that word suke is used one other time in the book of James in relationship to the truth and salvation. And that's where James says to receive the word engrafted, which is able to save your souls, your suke. So we're talking about spiritual salvation here, which can be lost, as James points out. So there's clearly no guarantee. You see how he just says we're talking about spiritual salvation when it clearly says so. And then he, he just says James is talking about losing salvation. Like there's no buildup. There's no like this is the verse. Sure. But this is the conclusion you must draw from it. Why should we draw that conclusion when it's talking about the error of his way saving a soul? And your soul, they said the Greek word suke is your mind. The, the engrafted word of God is able to save your soul. It's able to renew your mind. That's what renews our minds. Our spirits, that's not mentioned here. Our spirit is the, the, the thing that is resurrected and made alive. The reason we are saved is because our spirits have been reconciled to God. Our spirits have been uh, infused with the life of God. It is in our spirit. But our souls, our mind, our will, our emotions, that's that's still work, <laughs> not our work. That's still God working on us. God is still renewing our mind. God is still uh, uh, aligning our desires to to be his desires, what he wants for us. We want those things in our spirit because we're saved. But our minds, our will, our emotions don't always line up with the truth. So, of course, there's work that goes on. So to say that you are turning someone um, and saving their soul it's not in the same context as 
salvation saving of soul. This is someone who has believed. And again, you have to make the case for your conclusion. If you if you read this verse and say this is a loss of salvation, you already came to it saying that a believer can lose their salvation. Okay, because it's already saying a brother, like a brother, okay, a believer. So if you come to this verse with seeing everything else in scripture and seeing that a believer is someone who has been promised eternal life, who will never perish, and you come to this verse with that understanding, then you will have, you will leave with a different interpretation. So the same people who said we need to look at what the verse is saying and not bring our own doctrine to it are kind of going back on what they said. Um, so it's the same way uh, it says, it says, confess your faults to one another that you may be healed. Okay. That has nothing to do with, I'm not saying they said it has something to do with salvation, but it would be like saying that is about spiritual healing or being saved because you confess your sins to one another. No, that is about your mind. When you, when you get a weight off your chest to someone you trust and someone who can pour into you and encourage you, it brings healing to your mind. It brings peace that is not um, related to your actual salvation in Christ. It is simply related to your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. And cover a multitude of sins. And we all know there's a debate between James and Paul. But if we're going to take the Bible, we need to take the entire Bible. And we need to look at what has already been said and look at the context of each passage and understand that James was written before uh, Galatians. James was, uh, I think, the first New Testament book to be written, probably in the time that James was very, very heavily um, pushing Jewish agenda and Jewish mixture of old and new covenant like that's that's part of the context of james we need to put it in its right place and i'm not saying james wasn't inspired and stuff i'm just saying context is important so when he's talking about covering sins without mentioning the finished work of christ you have to put that where it belongs that james is talking about a saved person but presenting it as if uh bringing that person back from a sin is what saves them but you have to put James where it belongs that this is before really he came to that understanding of um, salvation, the way Paul preached grace to him and Peter. And it's described in the book of Acts, it's described in Galatians that James was, was not having it. James was not having people even mix Jews and Gentiles, but we're not going to get into all of that. So long story short, listen, this is not talking about lo losing salvation. They didn't prove that it's talking about losing salvation. It's, it proves that a believer can go wallow in the mire again. So the problem a lot of people run into is they take the fact that a believer can sin, that a believer sometimes yields to temptation. They take that and say, you've lost your salvation. I want, I want them to tell me when they lost their salvation because they've also admitted to sinning. And I want them to tell me how they got their, their salvation back because Hebrews says it's impossible to repent if you lose your salvation. I'd be interested in hearing that. Um, let's let's keep going. Let me see if I can increase the speed of this just a little bit. Uh, 1.25 so we can go through it a little. Guarantee that everyone in the Lord will stay in the Lord. There is a real possibility that someone can apostatize like we have through the whole Bible. And there's no guarantee that the person will come back. So it's a sacred task to help bring a straying believer back. And by bringing them back, we've saved them from death and covered a multitude of sins. But the one who endures to the end, oh, this one. he will be saved. Uh, many try to take that text and try to get out of it by saying, you know, Jesus right there is talking about enduring to the end of the tribulation. If you live through the whole tribulation, then your body will be saved. That's not the context. The context there is on the heels when Jesus makes this declaration. It's on the heels of Jesus' warning in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 that many will fall away from the faith. and They'll be seduced by false Christ and, and false prophets. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many people. And lawlessness or sin is going to increase and the love of many of jesus disciples will become cold cold towards the lord and warm towards the world but the one who endures to the end in the context it means the one Wait, who where did he get that from it says the love of many will, will grow cold and he just says cold towards the lord and warm towards the world like where do you get that from that's not there you're just adding to it endures in love for jesus christ fervently until the end Again, where is he getting that from? Where is he getting endures in love for Jesus Christ to the end? Like you're very obviously inserting stuff into the text.
I mean, that's that's as obvious as it gets. We'll be saved. Does it mean those who don't endure to the end will also be saved? <laughs> then we are going against the words of Jesus Christ. A similar passage is Matthew 10, 22, where Jesus says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Look, look at the next verse. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, not have gone through all the towns of Jerusalem or all the towns of Israel before um, before Jesus returns, basically. or uh, Yeah, something along those lines. And the first person to speak said, people say this is talking about the tribulation, but it's not. If you look at the context, it's talking about falling away. Well, it's talking about falling away in the tribulation. Um, we'll look at it in a second. But the way they brush aside the context of these passages is frankly concerning. Um, it's, it's concerning because you can see it right there. You can see brother will deliver brother over to death and the father, his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We'll look at that phrase, but I, I just want to talk about the context for a second that this is all dealing with tribulation. This is all dealing with persecution. These people are sitting in a room with expensive lights and cameras and like all the peace in the world and they're not being persecuted. So they're not enduring anything according to this passage. So what makes them think they are saved if they're not enduring to the end? The one who inserted endures in love and whatever for Jesus Christ, he has to insert that for it to make sense to him because like this is talking about a very specific period. This is talking about, let's just finish it. Let's finish it. Okay. Here Jesus is talking to believing disciples, people who have already been saved. And he's alerting us to the persecution and trials we will face as his disciples. Yet he warns us we must endure faithfully to the end in order to be saved. In that same uh, teaching of Jesus, he says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father who is in heaven. He says, don't fear men who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy your body and soul in hell. So Jesus is giving us salvific warnings here. And I think it's very important that we understand that. Now it's important that we understand that that's talking about belief or unbelief. It always comes down to that. It's if you deny Jesus in front of men, what are you doing? You're you're denying his him being God. You're denying that he's the savior of mankind. You are denying that he came and lived and died and was resurrected. So what does that mean? It means you're not saved. So he will deny you. He never knew you. He will deny you because you weren't saved. This is not a believer who says, I don't know Jesus. This is someone who's never saved. Okay. In that case, like they'll be, I'm I'm telling you, we will be so surprised the people we see in heaven thinking that they lost salvation and they're there because God is infinitely better than us. Okay. God is not like us. God doesn't, it, we'll be surprised. Um, but they're moving on to the next thing. So let's look at uh, this verse. He who endures to the end shall be saved. And I want to, again, point out the fact that you can't just draw these conclusions without telling us what it's, what it's actually talking about. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. Let's look at just headings to start off with. Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. The signs of, of the times and the end of the age. Okay, the great tribulation. These are all end time stuff. And even in the tribulation, there are different parts of it. Some of it is not even talking about revelation. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Okay, so let's read from verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. You will understand it if we were to go to Daniel and read um, what he described. So in your own time, do that. But then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. On the housetop, don't take anything out of your house. In your field, don't go get your clothes. If you're pregnant, woe to you. And pray that you your your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, because there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Why is Jesus saying all these things? Because the disciples asked him, what will be the signs of the times and the end of the age? So signs of the times, he dealt with that. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and all that before he returns. And then he's talking about the tribulation that already happened. This already happened. It's in the past for us. And he says, if someone says the Christ, because the Jews thought the Messiah would be like a spiritual, um, a political figure, a political leader like Caesar, who would deliver them from their enemies and stuff like that. So, pe so people would certainly point to 
this is the deliverer, this is the Christ. When the Jews thought this is the Christ, they weren't believing that Jesus, the son of Joseph, is returning. No, when Jew, if a Jew were to mislead another Jew by saying this is the Christ, he's talking about a political figure. So like this is not saying someone will pretend to be Jesus. No, this is saying someone will pretend to be a leader who claims to be the Messiah. But we know Jesus didn't come to do that, not in his first coming, his second coming, he will reign. Um, but then he says, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes the west, so will be the coming of the son of man. Okay, so let's see, let's see, let's see. I forgot where that verse was, the he who endures the end. Oh, there it is, verse 13, yeah. So let's read, there's a lot to get through. The disciples came to him and said, tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, take heed, no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. I am, and will deceive many. They will, they will follow them. I'm sure if you look in Jewish history, there'll be something like that. I haven't looked into that, but I'm sure there'll be something like that. Wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, all these things. Okay, these are the beginning of sorrows. And then they'll deliver up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended, will betray one another. Many false prophets will rise up. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness is when you actually try to live under the law. Okay, it's not, it's not, it's not sin. It's sin, yes, abounds in lawlessness, but lawlessness is the emphasis of the law over the grace of Jesus. And that will abound. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So the question that I have about this verse. To them is what is enduring and what is the end is it the end of your life is it the end of this tribulation period is it the end of like what is the end who decides what that end is because if you say it's the end of your life and you've ever sinned if you've ever um uh believed a false teaching if you've ever repented from anything that means you did something that was wrong you didn't endure so you've already been lost so this endurance is not, it's, it's, I've heard an interpretation that says, he who endures to the end shall be saved because uh, the saved people endure to the end. I'm not going to get into that. I, I don't know how I feel about that yet. I'll, I'll look into it more. But the context of this is the destruction of the temple, signs of the times, and the end of the age. We're not in a tribulation period, at least not in America right now, where these people are making the documentary. and. This great tribulation happened when the abomination of desolation stood in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, when the emperor offered, uh, was it a pig on the altar and desecrated the temple? This is very specific to Jewish history. This is not talking about Christians. So this verse is always used, and I used to be confused by it, but the context is pretty clear. Okay, so we're only halfway through this. And we are two hours into the stream. This is going to be a long. Uh, let's switch to this. Are you still with me? Let me know if you're if you're still here. Just drop a one or say I'm here in the comments. Let me know you're still with me. Oh. Revelation 3, 5. If you overcome, you'll be clothed in white garments. I will not erase your name from the book of life. Now, just look at this possibility that your name can be erased from the book of life. Now, wouldn't that presuppose that there is the possibility of doing that? Why give a promise to someone that I will not blot your name out of the book of life if it's impossible to have your name blotted out of the book of life? Yes, you're Christians now, but if you do this, this, and this in terms of belief and behavior, well, your name can be erased from the Lamb's book of eternal life. They say, oh, my name's in the book of life, it'll be there forever. Well, is Jesus telling a lie here? Is he making an empty threat? If you overcome, your name will never be erased from the book of life. What if you don't overcome? Now, it's interesting that some people seek to wiggle out of this solemn warning and they imagine that the book of life is made up of everybody who's ever lived. However, we know from Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, that the names of the lost were never written in the book of life. And the warning, therefore, could only apply to apostate former believers. It says in verse 6, he who has a year to hear, he who is willing to listen to the truth and face up to the facts, let him hear it. Okay. Uh, they're going to deal with counter arguments and I'm just going to hear that entire part out and present a counter argument to their arguments against the counter arguments. But let's look at he who endures. I like how that he kept that part short. Um, not he who endures, but I will not blot his name out. I'm just going to read this and then we'll continue. 
in verse four, um, it says, it says you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. Oh wait, let's start from, let's start from verse one. These things it says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works that you have a name and that you are alive, but you are dead. Okay. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Why would Jesus use language like this if it's not like unbelief versus belief again? Because you think you are alive. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. And this is a church. This is not individuals. Okay, well, it's made up of individuals. You are alive. You think you're alive. People think you're alive, but you're dead. You're not alive. You're 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 not saved. Okay, let's just put it bluntly. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. In other words, they are saved. Okay. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. It's a promise to believers. It's not a promise to, they said, well, if he says he will not blot out your name, then it means there is a possibility that he will blot out your name. But didn't they make an argument earlier saying, um, I forget I forget how they phrased it, that you can't take like an empty, you can't take an empty threat if, if, if there is no substance to it or something like that. So if, the, the line of reason they're going is if he threatened to blot out your name from the book of life, or if he said he wouldn't block out your name from the book of life, then that means he can blot out your name from the book of life. But he said he wasn't going to because you overcame. How did you overcome? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. What is that? That is faith. You overcome. Lord, uh, let's see. Even our faith is the only part of this verse I remember off the top of my head. Of my head, um, even where is it? Overcomes. I know this verse is in First John, I believe, but I want to show you something. Oh yeah, there it is. For whatever y'all can see this right. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world: our faith. So he who overcomes, I will clothe in white and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Who is the one who overcomes? The one who has faith, the one who has believed in Jesus. That's the person who's not going to be blotted out of the book of life because he's a Christian. <laughs> it's not saying a Christian will lose his salvation. It's saying every believer is guaranteed to be in the book of life. I mean, this is as clear as it could possibly be. Um. Okay, let's go on. We're, I don't want to drag on too long, so let's try and let's try and go through all their counter arguments and um and for the night. It's gonna be a lot of time, but let's just listen. Oh, in him. So they're gonna present what I would say that the things that I would say to to contradict their their false teaching that they're giving right now. Um, and I want you to now notice how they twist things. I don't even have to say anything. I don't even have to comment on these because the verses will be very clear, but they will find a way to turn it into something else. So this is the opposite of the first time. Their arguments, we had to listen and look at what the context says and see how they're not really taking things in context. This time, the context is clear. What it's saying is clear, but we're going to note how they twist the truth. So. Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Those who believed in forms of once saved, always saved, will frequently point to Paul's words in Ephesians 1, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Greek, seal is often, you know, a stamp, a seal of approval, a seal that a king puts on something that it belongs to him. Uh, and seals can be broken, stamps can be effaced. Everybody in Paul's world knew seals could be broken. There were seals on amphoras. Why? Sorry, I was muted. This is the seal of the Holy Spirit, though. 
And it doesn't say the Holy Spirit has given you a seal. It says the Holy Spirit is the seal. So tell me who can break the Holy Spirit. Fine jars. There were seals on documents. The same thing for the word earnest, which unfortunately is sometimes translated as guarantee. Well, guarantee. <laughs> Obviously, you have been guaranteed your salvation by the Holy Spirit. That's the end of it. You're going to be saved. Well, translation is a tricky business. <laughs> Even the word guarantee has more than one signification. But the word earnest is like earnest money. It means a down payment. So we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, meaning we have received the Holy Spirit as an inheritance, as a deposit on what is to come. If you think what God's done in your life so far is great, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Holy Spirit is just the, if you will, first installment of God's work in your life and where this is all going. Paul's wonderful okay, statement what's the second? about the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a down payment, allows us to make a distinction what between is assurance and eternal security. About four times, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as the proof that we are saved. What is the evidence that you are a Christian? The work of the Holy Spirit in your life, changing your affections, changing your desires, making you able to live the life of Christ in ways that were simply never possible before the cross. We have powerful assurance for the internal working of the Holy Spirit. We don't need some kind of eternal security. We simply need reassurance. So that's the sealing of, by the Holy Spirit, that by receiving the Spirit... It's not about what you think we need or what you think we don't need. It's about what the Bible says. If the Holy Spirit is the deposit... Let's go what he said. If, it's, if he's the deposit in our spirits, tell me how the deposit of God can be removed. Because Peter says... The, the seed of God is incorruptible and a seal, even when Pilate put the seal on the tomb of Jesus, you would be killed if you remove that seal because he's Pilate. And you're telling me any someone can remove the seal of the Holy Spirit? I'm sure they're going to go to when Jesus says no one can snatch them out of my hand. And if they do, I'll really cover that. But let's, you can see what I'm talking about. They're just going to try and find a way around it. Um, so I'm not going to talk much on a lot of these kind of arguments so we can get through this. Spirit, Romans 8, 16, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And Romans 8, Galatians 4, God's put within us the spirit of the son saying, Abba, Father. So we have this deposit down payment. That's the seal of God saying, you're one of mine. You belong to me. I've given you my spirit. That's all it says. He is not saying you can live any way you want in the oh, meantime because you've been sealed. That would never be consistent with the teachings of Paul. Paul goes on to warn, warn the church of Ephesus that if they practice immorality and wicked sins. He gives a vice list. He says, no, for certain, don't let anyone deceive you, he says, because a lot of people are deceiving people in this. Let no one deceive you by vain words because of these things. You will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. The same thing you have in Ephesians. No, no, no. Let's go back to that. Come on. You can't just, can't just skip stuff. That was 39, 20. Let's go to 39, 18. Okay. Fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. Why? Because you have saint, you have become saints. It says you are saints, so don't be doing foolish things, <laughs> filthiness, foolish talking, whatever. For this, you know that no whoremonger or unclean person or all of these people has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. These people are not saved, but you are saved, so don't act like them. Okay, because of these things come with the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. What is obedience? Obedience is to believe. Faith. Faith. Believing in Jesus is obedience. Because they are acting like these, this, the wrath of God came upon them. So don't act like them. Why? Because you are not them. You are safe. They skip all of that and just look at, oh, like you are not a whoremonger. You're, that's not your identity. You are a saint. So don't act like a whoremonger. I mean, this is this is actually funny. The same thing you have in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 about being sealed by the Holy Spirit, you have in Ephesians 4, 30. But in Ephesians 4, 30, it also says, not only are you sealed by the Spirit, but that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. So we've been sealed in the day of salvation, but then he warns us. As soon as he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, he says, uh, who is the seal of your salvation? So grieving the Spirit, yes, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean we lose our salvation. He reassures us of the Holy Spirit's work in our life while instructing us to not grieve the Holy Spirit. So it's like, don't grieve the Spirit, but he is the seal of your, your, your salvation. He's the seal of your inheritance. It's not saying grieving the Holy Spirit will make you lose salvation. You have to insert that to make it mean what it doesn't. 
And I said I wasn't going to talk much, but like, <sighs> okay, let's keep going. Us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And Paul is uh, taking a reference there from Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, when they were going into the promised land, but they grieved God's Holy Spirit and they became his enemies and he wiped many of them out. And so we have to be very clear that you can do despite to the Spirit, like it says in Hebrews 10. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, that's uh, grieving away the means of our salvation. If the Spirit troubles you this morning, thank God he's troubling you before you go to hell. The Spirit will leave you. Well, this is what you can do with the Holy Spirit. Accept him. Resist him, grieve him, quench him. Yeah, but you can't lose him. Another verse that you often hear from the ones who have always saved camp is uh, John 10, 27 to 28. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so they will say, uh, you know, you are once saved, always saved um, as, a, as a Christian, because he gives you eternal life, and you'll never perish. So John 10, Jesus says that his sheep hear his voice and that we are safely kept in the Father's hand, who is greater than all, and no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. That is incredibly good news. John 10 is an incredibly beautiful passage. Uh, it has to do with our security in Christ, that no one can snatch us out of the Greek. Y'all caught that, right? It has to do with our security in Christ. Okay. But there's a but coming. There's a but coming, right? Okay. It has to do with our security in Christ. But, okay. The Greek word tarpazo. Nobody can by force take us from his hand or the Father's hand. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. But you can jump out of the Father's hand if you like. He will not force us to stay. If someone says, I do not want God anymore, then we can leave and walk away. That's always been the case. We've always had the choice and it happened throughout the Bible. And that's why there's so many warnings in the New Testament. Because the sheep there are defined as those who follow Christ. The Greek present tense is used. They follow, continue to follow Christ. They believe in him. It's the Greek present tense again. They believe, continue to believe in him. In John 10, you have all these present indicative verbs. My sheep are hearing my voice. They are following me. The condition in this verse is when he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And so if you're no longer following Christ, if you're no longer following his voice, then you no longer have the promises of this verse. They follow me and I give them eternal life. What if you don't follow? Is that promise still going to be fulfilled? No, because you're not saved. A Christian, this is a descriptive passage. It is descriptive. It is describing what a Christian does. It's not prescribing what makes a Christian. Okay. So if I say, um, if I say, a Tesla is an electric car. I'm describing what a Tesla is. It, I, it doesn't mean I'm saying an electric car is a Tesla because there are different kinds of electric cars, but every Tesla is an electric car. Okay. At least as far as I know. So it's describing, and I'm not saying you have to be an electric car to be a Tesla. I'm saying if you're a Tesla, you're an electric car. If you're a believer, you hear Jesus. If you're a believer, you follow Jesus. It's who you are. Whether you're acting like it or not, it's not like that's not the point of the passage. You should act like it because that's who you are. But if you're a believer, you are his sheep. And if you're his sheep, you hear him and you follow him. We'll look at this in more detail. Let's let's finish. They don't follow me and I still give them eternal life. The problem is when people want to take the promises of the Bible without taking the conditions of the Bible. It's all one sentence. The condition is to believe. I mean, that's it. You can't reject the first part and say he just gives us eternal life. And these people who follow me, hear my voice and follow me, will never perish. The scriptures are very clear. You know, one thing I love about this documentary so far is that if you just pause on the verses that you're taking out of context, you get the, you get everything you need to prove them wrong. Uh, we're at 27. Let's go to 26. Okay. You see where they've highlighted? which is the part they want to take out of context. Read, just read the couple of lines above it. But ye believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Oh, so it's about those who believe. It's not about a sheep who loses salvation. It's about believing and becoming a sheep. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would believe. You are like, you would have faith in me. That's what it's always been about. But like it's right there. It's 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 magnified and it's right there. Lord, 
who follow me, hear my voice and follow me, will never perish. The scriptures are very clear that a sheep can harden his heart. In fact, Jesus addresses the sheep in Luke 12. He says, little flock, he's addressing the flock of sheep. And he warns them that they're to be like the good and faithful servant who gives out meat in due season. But he says, if that servant... Hold on, you can't just jump, like, how many verses? If you're not a little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay. Where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. Let your noise be greater about. Be yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Okay, this is how you should live because you are part of the little flock and it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay. The Lord will come in a day when he's looking out for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers because he's not a believer. Okay. The man, the servant that Jesus will come see doing the right things, it's not just an act, but in faith, who has believed, who has been transformed in their heart. That is the right thing. That is the work of God. Jesus says this in John chapter six, the work of God is to believe in him who he has sent. So the right thing is to believe. If he comes and finds that you don't believe, your portion will be with the unbelievers because you do not believe. Okay servant that same servant that same sheep in the flock uh, goes and beats the maid servants and gets drunk with the drunkards that they'll be cut in pieces and thrown with the unbelievers jesus says in luke 12 well revelation 21 8 says unbelievers go to lake of fire that's a bad deal no. so scriptures warn that you can harden your heart it says those who are not found in the book of life were thrown into the lake of fire and we saw in an earlier verse that the overcomers are believers who will not be blotted out from the book of life so they are in the book of life so they are not thrown into the lake of fire if you're going to draw a conclusion prove it as a sheep and no longer hear his voice. So as I understand scripture, we can know that we know that we know that we're saved. We can have absolute confidence in God's keeping power, but the warnings are real. Are they not the same people who say we can't know until we die? I mean, this is, I don't know how long each, each interview was in reality, but like it's only 40 minutes and you've contradicted yourselves many, many times. You said we couldn't know, and now you're saying we can know, but the warnings are still there. Okay, John chapter 10 is what they looked at. Um, I, okay, let's just summarize it. We already looked at it. The verse above said belief, right? I don't want to. I don't want to take too much time. So let's go. Let's go. Let's keep going. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Romans 7 has been a controversial passage for two millennia. And the big question, is it talking about the normal life of a believer, that you do the things that you hate and the things that, that, that you, you want to do, you don't do, and that you live this kind of schizophrenic life, and then you recognize, I'm just a wretched sinner saved by grace. And then Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation. Is that the way to read it? Or is Paul talking about life under the law? before he knew the Lord. The early church understood it properly. Uh, the early church for the first few centuries of church history understood that the Apostle Paul was speaking of uh, himself before he was saved. In fact, it wasn't until uh, Augustine brought in the church the idea that Paul's talking about himself as a, as a saved person. And he just, you know, he's living an immoral life. He, he things he wants to do, he can't do. And uh, things he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing. And he's a slave to sin. Well, is that really what Paul sounds like throughout the entire rest of the New Testament? Absolutely not. There is nothing in any of Paul's other letters that sound even remotely like Romans 7 as a paradigm or even a common experience in the Christian life. For this reason alone, we ought to be very wary of those who think that Romans 7 is describing a typical struggle for a typical Christian as they try to work out the Christian life. I personally grieve when I hear a noted Christian preacher say that Romans 7 describes the normal Christian life. That yes, we love Jesus, but we're unable to resist sin. Thankfully, there are certain Calvinists uh, that do disagree with that viewpoint. Uh, Douglas Moo, for instance, uh, Hoekema, other Calvinists say no, Paul's definitely contextually in a lost state there before he found Christ. My answer is this. Why don't we put that as a big question mark and see what's written in Romans 6 and Romans 8? In other words, the passages that sandwich Romans 7. One of the great disasters in the church is separating chapter 6, 7, and 8. They must be read together. Romans 6 is quite explicit. We have died to sin in baptism. We've been buried with the Lord and ra raised in the of life. We cannot continue in sin. Paul is explicit in Romans 6, 11, Romans 6, 14. Don't let sin have dominion over you. After Paul cries out to Jesus and says, and at the end of Romans 7, you know, who will save me from this body of death? But when you go to chapter 8, Jesus is the one that gives him deliverance. Chapter 8 provides an amazing, glorious victory of the Christian over these kinds of temptations. They receive, like Jesus did, the Holy Spirit to attend their ways 
and to empower them to do what God calls them to do in this life. We read in Romans chapter 8, the first few verses, that the law of life and spirit gave him victory over the law of sin and death. Now he's under the new covenant. He's not in the Romans 7 state anymore. So, is it possible for us to defeat sin? For me? No. But the Holy Spirit in me can. And so those injunctions that Paul gives so strongly in Romans 6 are possible. But they're possible in the light of Romans 8. Chapter 7 seems to be a digression where Paul is talking about the experience of trying to live a victorious Christian life in the power of following the law of Moses. So however we interpret Romans 7, the reality is that in the Lord, we are expected to, we are called to lead new godly lives. And in fact, nothing else is countenanced. So Romans 7, unfortunately, has been used as a, as a license for many people. It breaks my heart because there are countless Christians quoting Romans 7 as they're living wicked lives. But Paul says, if you live this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm laughing because I agree with everything they just said. They sound like grace preachers. Romans 7 is about a person who's trying to live under the law to do things to be saved because they'll find that there's a different law working in them where they can do what they actually want to do. And the answer to that situation is Romans 8, because when you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. Like, I, I was even talking to a brother of mine the other day about this. Like, I agree with everything they just said. So how can you say all of this? And say that sin will make a believer go to hell. Like, that's where I'm confused. Like, you, like this is the one portion where you sound like a grace preacher. But, like, it, it's not connecting. It's not clicking. That because you've been set free from the person who said, um, can I defeat sin? No, sin has been defeated. And we are free. We live free from condemnation because we are not under the power of sin anymore. No, like... I don't understand. How can you? I agree with everything that I said. There's no reason to even like say anything about it. But how can you say all of that and still like be against being saved forever? That's interesting. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, and I'm sure a favorite for many Christians. Yes, we are dead to sin. We're completely dead to sin. So sin has no dominion over us, um, Jude. Um, so when he said, like, he won't defeat sin, the reason it's funny is because he they've, they've all been saying how, you know, they sin, but they haven't lost their salvation because none of them has said that they've lost their salvation. But then they point to other people and say that you are telling them to go and keep sinning. But you just said you sin and you don't believe in eternal security. So is it the knowledge and understanding and belief in eternal security that makes a person sin or do you just sin because you are still in this body you just admitted to sin and yet you don't believe in eternal security so why are you saying that the knowledge of eternal security makes someone sin in that case then you should never sin because you don't believe in it that's why it's funny to me but since it's romans 8 28 to 39 says we know and all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And then he goes on and, and speaks about those eternal purposes. For those whom he foreknew, predestined, those he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. Calvinists actually call this the golden chain that, you know, those who are called, you know, and so forth, all the way to glorification. I agree with John Wesley, who stated that uh, Paul's not saying that everybody that was called is justified, that everybody that's justified ends up being glorified. He's just showing how God works in salvation. Paul does not affirm, either here or in any other part of his writings, that precisely the same number of men are called, justified, and glorified. He does not deny that a believer may fall away and be cut off between his special calling and his glorification. Romans 11, 22. He only affirms that this is the method whereby God leads us step by step toward heaven. Even when you look at the so-called steps in these links in this golden chain, not any one step guarantees the next step. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. So just being called doesn't mean you automatically be chosen. Peter says in 2 Peter 1.10, to make your calling an election, which is you're being chosen, make it sure, ratify it. In the context, there's continuing in the faith. So that doesn't guarantee that you'll you'll be justified. And those who are justified, they can't say, well, I'm for sure going to be glorified uh, automatically. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, the just shall live by faith. But if he draws back, He's not going forward in that chain, now he's going backwards. My soul will have no pleasure in him. As we go on, when we see this list of what can separate us from the love of Christ, dealing with tribulation and angels, demons, principalities, life, death itself, there's nothing outside of you, nothing outside of you that can pull you away. There's one thing in that list that's, that's missing from that list. That would be you. What Paul is saying is no external circumstance or external. Okay, please spare me this part. I forgot to mention this when we're dealing with John chapter 10, where it says, um, no one can snatch out of the Father's hand. And they were like, but you can walk away. I forgot to mention that. And that's the same thing that he's saying here. People think Jesus, like, he, they all interpret it as one thing. Jesus didn't say one thing. He said two things. He said, 
they, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That's one. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's two. So it's not one situation. You will never perish. Okay, question. If you walk away, if you were to walk away, if you were to lose your, oh, sorry, I'm getting my thoughts together. If you were to walk away, would that mean you lost your salvation? I'm sure they would say yes, because that's what they've been saying the whole documentary. You've lost your salvation. Okay. If you lose your salvation, does that mean you've per you will perish? Well, if you don't repent, yes. Okay. But Jesus said you will never perish. So walking away is included in the first scenario where if you believe, you will never perish. And then if you were to raise the question that, okay, Lord, you're saying I will never perish, that you've got me. What if someone were to cause me to perish? And his answer is neither will anyone snatch you out of my hand. So it's two situations there. It's not just one. What's missing from the list is you. You can separate yourself from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Really? Are you stronger than death? If death cannot separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus or angels or principalities, who, who are you against death? You've already died and be reconciled to God. Okay, someone said that you will you will undock yourself from Christ. Then you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand that the gospel means that you are joined permanently to Christ. He who is he who he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You are joined forever. There's no separation. So you can't separate yourself from God. If you what would cause you to separate yourself from God? That would be sin. You just admitted to sin. And so have you been separated from God? I mean, all you have to do is ask yourself these questions and you see that there's a big problem in this theology. We're almost there. Uh, 20 more minutes, but we're going at 1.5 speed. So let's finish this up. Eternal person, not even a demon, not even an angel. Advocates of once saved, always saved propound this verse as though Paul followed his question with the words, shall adultery or murder or theft or fornication or covetousness or lying? In other words, no matter what our sins may be, they will not separate us from God's love. Yet that's not what Paul said. He followed his question with these words, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Now those are not sins. Those are things that Paul and his other faithful Christians were suffering. They're most yeah, but the reason we talk about sin is because you make it all about sin. And I'm glad they pointed it out that this is not even talking about sin we, because Paul has already dealt with a sin situation that we've been justified. We've been, we are dead to sin. We've been raised up. So we should yield our bodies as instruments of righteousness. He's already said that we should, um, uh, uh, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we've been set free from the law of sin and death. Paul has dealt with sin completely in his arguments. So all that's left is for you to understand that you are joined to God and then live accordingly. That's why in chapter 12, he says that do not be conformed to the things of the world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, because now you understand that you are dead to sin. You understand who you are. So you can live according to that. Again, no grace preacher says you should continue to sin. If a grace preacher says that, you're not an authentic preacher. Like no preacher says that. So multiple different ways to read this, none of which support the idea that you can be wonderfully born again, forgiven of your sin, cleansed, transformed, and then go out and live however you want to live, commit whatever okay. sin you want to commit. Maybe your life cuts short, maybe you lose treasure in heaven, but you still go to heaven. There's not a syllable in the New Testament that supports that idea, and Romans 8 certainly does not. It's a serious travesty in the church right now that the most popular message ever preached in the Sermon on the Mount has, in many churches, fallen by the wayside because it's considered legalistic. Many people have difficult... What is with that man and... I don't know their name, so sorry. Um, I don't remember their names, um, with like popularity and what's majority says this. And like the Sermon on the Mount is legalistic because Jesus gave that sermon under the law to elevate the standards of the law and tell you that you have heard it said, do not commit adultery where you think adultery is just sleeping with someone else's wife or husband. But I'm telling you that if you even look at a person with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. This is legalistic. Legalistic is not a bad word. It just means it is related to the law. And Jesus came to show us the true standard of the law so that we will believe. The Bible says the law is a tutor. It's a teacher to show us why we need Christ. So Jesus came to show you that what you think you're doing to obey the law is nothing. The true standard is up here and you, you're like underground. So don't even try because you need me. You need, you need to believe in me. I'm the only one who can save you. I'm the only one who can fulfill this. The Sermon on the Mount is about that. So I'm just saying all of that 
let them say everything that they will say. I'm not going to talk anymore about this part and then we'll move on to the next thing. But I'm pretty sure they're going to try and like, if Jesus said, take out your eye, if it causes you to sin, I guarantee you that all these men have sinned with their eyes before, yet they, they all have two eyes. I was going to pass a joke that some have four eyes, but you know, that's not, that's not nice. <laughs> it's just a joke, but they still have two eyes. They haven't cut their hand off because their hand caused them to sin. But this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So if you're going to take that literally, take the whole thing literally. Don't like, don't cut corners. Difficulty with the Sermon on the Mount. They will look at what Jesus is saying there and they will say, well, that's impossible. Moses said, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, you should not murder. But Jesus said, if you, if you hate someone in your heart, then you commit murder in your heart. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, if once saved, always saved is true, then th that statement is false. For it would mean that we will be admitted to heaven even if we haven't forgiven others their trespasses. In Ephesians, it says, forgive as Christ forgave you. So is that a contradiction? No, it's under two different covenants. This is under the law where you do things for salvation. Ephesians is under grace where you do things because of salvation. We forgive because we've been forgiven, not to gain forgiveness. So this is this is the meaning of the rightfully divide the word, put things in their place where they belong. If it belongs under the law, then let it be under the law. It doesn't matter what majority says or uh, like the most popular sermon on like, no, we called it the Sermon on the Mount. This was Jesus probably calling it, y'all are not doing what you think you're doing. <laughs> All right. Trespasses. Jesus gives teaching about divorce and remarriage there. He gives teaching about living a holy life. He gives teaching about not following adultery and how serious that is. Passages that totally warn against the idea of once saved, always saved. So a lot of people don't like the Sermon on the Mount and they say, no, it's not really for the church. And they will then say, and the proof of that is in Matthew 5, 48, when Jesus says, you must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Well, obviously, <laughs> none of us can be as perfect as God. So obviously Jesus doesn't intend for us to live in those ways. We hear this, be perfect as even your heavenly father is perfect. But what is he talking about? I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. Matthew 5 does not end with be perfect as a summary of Matthew 5, 17 to 48, but as a crystallization of the love of God for all people visible in the sun and the rain falling upon all people. He does not only love those who love him. He does not only love those who love him back. His love is perfect. It is complete. And that's the sense of the Greek word there. Teleos means perfect or mature or complete. Those are the three basic meanings of that word. When Paul uses language like this, for example, in Philippians, he's actually using some another point on the spectrum of words of what telos can mean. Namely, he's talking about growing up, becoming mature in Christ. So the word doesn't just have one meaning, i.e. perfection. It has a spectrum of meanings ranging from goal, completion, perfection, maturity. And the idea of our righteousness surpassing that of the Pharisees, well, that, that just can't be done. But this ignores the interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were disciples of Moses. They followed the law of Moses. But on the end, the only way a righteousness can surpass that of the Pharisee is if you believe in Jesus. Because the Pharisees were very, very obedient to the law of Moses. But they did not believe in Jesus. So Jesus was telling them to believe in him. It's really as simple as that. The inside, Jesus said they weren't cleansed, that they appeared righteous on the outside, exactly. but inwardly they were filthy. And so Christianity is about that inward purity. The righteousness of the Pharisees was not something. But you just described outward works. And then you say Christianity is about inward purity. So which is it? If you're inwardly pure, yes, you will live a certain way. But if you're not living that way yet, you just said it's not about that. Hmm. Thing uh, that was, wow, unattainable. It, it was below the minimum accepted standard. <laughs> the disciples were supposed to preach the gospel to all the nations and to teach them to observe everything that he commanded the disciples to follow, which would be the Sermon on the Mount. And that's how we're supposed to be discipling people. We cannot dare just in Jesus' teaching and claim to be. Okay, so, sir, why do you have two eyes and two hands? You've sinned with your hands before since you were a kid. You've sinned with your eyes before. Why do you have two eyes and two hands? Unless they're prosthetics. But you should cut those off as well or remove them if you've sinned with them. Jesus' commandment was to believe in him and love one another as he loved us. Context will tell you that. So you can't just take, he, he also just brushed over, oh, he says adultery is not what we think it is. Well, what is it? Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Then you should remove your eyes. Because you've already admitted to sinning, so it had to be with somebody part. It had to be with your eyes, your mouth, your hands, something. 
but you're not obeying it. So are you saved? I mean, come on. To be New Testament Christians. When the Sermon on the Mount ends, Jesus gives a little story that we sang as children, that the wise man built his house upon a rock. It was actually a very serious story by Jesus, an image to say at the end that the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine and does them. It is absolutely disastrous to read the Sermon on the Mount as if Jesus is saying, this is the intense righteousness that God wants and you'll never fulfill it. No, that is not at all what Jesus does. It is he is pointing to himself. Okay, I, I don't want to keep saying this, but if you want to do everything Jesus said, if we were to go through the list, you see that they have failed so many times over. I, I just don't, I just, I don't like how they're like sitting so like... <sighs> It is for people who are already disciples, and Jesus said- I don't want to assume that they are prideful and stuff, but it is a prideful thing to say that you can do everything that Jesus just said. Then what's the point of Jesus coming? What's the point of him fulfilling the law on our behalf and dying? Like Romans chapter 8 says, so that the righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us. If we could fulfill all of this, why did we need faith in Jesus? If we could, if righteousness came by the law and obeying these things, Christ came in vain. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21. Does that let's, let's it says to them, this is what following me looks like in the kingdom of God. We are to be holy. We're to strive for that equality, which sets us apart from the world. And that is not an option. If we're not going to do that, we're not going to make it. This is what Jesus is teaching. So the Sermon on the Mount it, is discipleship for those who want to follow Jesus into the kingdom of God. It's either you are saved or you're not. There's no making it to heaven. The central error of the hyper grace message is that the moment you're saved, God only forgives your past and present. What what is hyper grace? That that term is so de like degrading, and they use it in a degrading manner. Hyper grace. You're saying you're being overly gracious. Really, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I mean, the Bible is pretty hyper grace. The law came through Moses, but grace and peace, grace and peace, or grace and truth. I was confused too. Came through Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is, is God himself. God is above everything. If grace is Jesus, then grace is as hyper as it gets. Like you saying hyper grace means nothing. It's just, it's just you trying to downplay what it actually says. Present sense, he not only forgives who you are and what you've done, but at that moment, he forgives every sin that you will ever commit in the future. All your yeah. past sins are forgiven when you're first saved, but your future sins are not pre-forgiven. In other words, you start with a clean slate, but you can muddy that slate again. Uh, we know that we're forgiven our past sins, not our future sins, because in 2 Peter chapter 1, it warns about those who forget that they were cleansed from their past sins. That's why we read in James. I knew who was going to bring that up. Okay. James chapter 5, verse 19 20, when the brother who is brought back after he falls away from the Lord, it says you'll save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. That's why we're told that we're to confess our sins, and then he's faithful and just forgive us our sins. If people say their future sins are also forgiven, like some people do preach, then 1 John 2, 1, 1 John 1, 9 is meaningless. If we confess. No, 1 John 1 verse 9 is talking about people who were not saved. If you read, if you just read verse eight, it says, if you say you have not sinned, you are calling God a liar and his truth is not in you. These were people who were arguing. These are the Gnostics they talked about earlier who are arguing that we are not born sinful. Like there's nothing like indwelling sin or um, original sin in us when we are born, like no one is sinful. So John is saying that and throughout scripture, when people say we, it's not always including the writer. It's like it's a way of of making things a little easier to say because if i come and i say you need to do this and this or you are not you are you are sinful and god loves you and stuff I, I, like it sounds more attacking and if i say oh yeah we we sin we do stuff that we're not supposed to do but and i mean i do too i'm not saying i don't but it's it's easier to take it in so sometimes the writers of of these letters include themselves but it's not referring to the current state of a believer. So when John says, if we say we have no sin, he's talking to people who said they were not born with sin. And so, but if we confess, read it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous or just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, got to love that word, all, all unrighteousness. In John 2, it says, this is, you, I write this so you know that your sins have been forgiven. Okay, so Peter says, yes, uh, they forgot that they've been cleansed from their past sins, but it's not exclusive. He's not saying you've only been cleansed from your past sins. I mean, that's easy to see. Um, Confess our sins. 
we'll, we'll finish. He's this. faithful and just to forgive us. I say, Lord, I have to confess nothing. They're already forgiven. There's too many scriptures that are over throughout the New Testament. It's what the early church taught as well. You must continue to confess your sins. Now, if we die and there's one sin unconfessed, well, guess what? We're branches in the vine. Uh, falling short of the Lord, Lord doesn't sever us from the vine. It's apostasy that severs us from the vine. Uh, that's a continual rebellion against God. So the idea that your future. This is what I talked about in the beginning, that they will say um, sin, 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 sin. And then when it's like one thing they'll be like oh if you forgot to confess or in this case if you died before confessing then you know it, it doesn't count you're not severed from divine so what is the limit of sin tell me how how many sins it takes to be severed from divine you're saying it's apostasy well a true apostate was never a believer according to john they went out from us because they were never a part of us but if saying you're you no longer believe but when in reality you are a believer, like your heart has already been transformed, doesn't sever you from the vine, then what is this documentary about? As you can see, I've gotten more annoyed as time has gone on. Um, let's finish. Future sins are forgiven would imply that your, your sins are forgiven so apart from control. repentance. Now, if you sin in the future, there is forgiveness for those sins How? if you repent. And what sin? If you repent. But we just saw in Hebrews that you cannot repent if you fall away. We just saw in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So if you sin tomorrow, you have to shed blood to be forgiven. The reason you, the reason your future sins are forgiven is because the blood of Jesus was shed only one time for all time. That's the reason. It's not because you are so special. It's because Jesus is special and his blood is better than that of bulls and goats. And he doesn't have to be sacrificed every day or every year or every month for your sin. You confess, you tell God that, God, I'm sorry because you have a relationship with him, but you've been forgiven. Why is it so hard to just believe? I'm sorry, but some of these people, I don't know their hearts. I don't know if they're saved or not. But it's a lot of these people who will hear Jesus say, I never knew you. Because they think they're doing so much to keep their salvation, but they don't even believe. They're reading the Bible. They're, they think they're doing the things. They think they're fulfilling the Sermon on the Mount and they still have two eyes and two hands. But Jesus will say, listen, you did all these things, but you never believed. And that would be very painful. Sin in the life of the Christian can do without repentance is get in the way of receiving the ongoing forgiveness that Christ has already provided. That's the way to look at it. So ongoing forgiveness that Christ has already provided. How does that make sense? Christ has, Christ has forgiven you. I've already said this. Without a shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Um, we have 12 minutes. He died for all of our sins before we ever committed a single sin. Oh. However, forgiveness is transacted for what we have done. Our sins are taken care of at the cross by Jesus Christ. Our subjective experience of forgiveness and reconciliation with God is an ongoing relationship with God that we conduct in confession, admission, repentance, and restitution. How many times have you confessed every single sin you've committed? I'll argue that it's zero. You can't even remember every sin you committed. Romans 5 verse 1 says, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We've already been reconciled. There's no ongoing reconciliation. We've Yes, our experience, we might feel like we're not reconciled. We might think that we're not, but we have been. I think there's a real false dilemma between you either believe in once saved, always saved, or you believe that you're saved by your works. There is no righteous act that I can commit that would give me status with God. There's nothing. Here comes the contradiction. So everything they've said, especially in the beginning, right he just put jesus on the cross again everything they said in the beginning about how you should do this and this and you should be living by the sermon on the mountain you all heard that they said all these things they argued for these things but now they're gonna say oh we're not preaching that you should be saved by your works paul says if it's not grace it is works so they're saying oh your people argue that it's either this or that it's not really that there's a middle ground no 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 paul said if it's not grace it is works if it is works, it cannot be grace. So everything they're about to say doesn't make sense in the light of the scriptures. I already know. Like, I haven't watched this, but I already know. Nothing I can do that would save me from the condemnation of my sins. We are saved by faith. What does give us standing with God? The blood of Christ. Nothing else but the blood of Christ gives us standing with him. Justification is by faith. That means a person is declared righteous by God on the basis of Christ's sacrifice of what Christ has done for us. So it's but, not about getting something the old fashioned way by earning it. It never was. Salvation is by grace and through faith. Saved. But those who are saved because of the grace of God 
are transformed into agents of good works in this world. Obviously. That is the order. Because you have been saved, you live a certain way. But the whole time, everything they've been saying is you should live a certain way to really be saved. You can't make this up. Good works are part of the process of being sanctified. In fact, Ephesians says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Jesus in Matthew 5, 16, demonstrate your good works. Shine your light to the world that they'll praise your Father in heaven. First Peter 2 says, live in such a way among the ungodly that they'll, they'll see your behavior and be drawn to God. If we're justified by faith, which is a living faith that results in works, it's not works that justifies us. Uh, works are just the evidence of living faith. And as long as we are in the faith and we have the faith, then we have the promises of faith, like eternal life and the forgiveness of sin. Well, salvation has three tenses. I have been saved, I am being saved, I shall be saved. And until you get through all three tenses, the situation is not resolved. Just no. The tenses of salvation have to do with the parts of our being. We have been saved because our spirits have been reunited with God. That's done. That is the salvation. That is what gives us access to the things that they are describing as being saved and uh, will be saved. No, we have been saved. That's point blank period. Now, our minds are being renewed. That is our soul's experience of salvation. And our bodies will be regenerated. We'll receive new bodies in the future. That is our body's experience of salvation. But we have been saved. The difference is very important. When he said, then what's the point of the video? Okay, I know, right? When he said that at the moment of salvation, I passed it. But not a future word. Does Jesus have to be crucified again? I guess that's what they're arguing that every time they sin, because they already admitted to sin, and every time they sin, Jesus is crucified for them. And then they said that when a Christian sins, they are sacrificing Jesus again. So they're they're like they're not only contradicting themselves; they are the people that they are talking about, based on their theology. They are the same people that they are talking about. Justification by faith does not mean that there is a locked door behind us. Justification means that people have been launched into the kingdom of God and they are now called to follow Jesus. If they choose to walk away from Jesus, it is because their faith has collapsed that they've chosen to walk away. It is not that we measure our salvation every day by how much we worked, how many good deeds we did, and how many bad deeds we didn't do. No. How does your faith collapse? Like, describe that to me. How does your faith collapse? And this gentleman is is contradicting himself it's not that we're saying we should work for our salvation what did you guys just say oh that is not gospel holiness that is not gospel grace this is our response to what the grace of god has done in our lives those who are in christ filled by the spirit do what the law wanted them to do and even more so no you can do more than the law oh lord then why did jesus die you can do the law you can do what the law wants you to do and even more but you have two eyes and two hands. No, good works do not save us. On the other hand, salvation that does not issue in a transformed life has missed the whole point. And who decides how much time should pass before a transformed life? Some people are saved and they, they look saved. They look the part within a month. They look the part within a year. Some people are saved and they go through serious battles for a decade, two decades, 30 years before According to these people, they look saved. Are you telling me that Jesus would abandon them at any point of this journey because their minds weren't renewed fast enough? Who are you to decide when someone, like the time frame for someone to, to bear fruit? Who are you to decide that? How long did it take you to bear fruit? And who decided what that fruit was? This is, this is the annoying thing when they make themselves the judge of who's really saved. The promises of the New Covenant in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel is that something new is going to occur. And that something new is at times expressed as a dynamic presence of God's Spirit. Jeremiah says, God's going to give you a new covenant, but it's going to be a new covenant because I'm going to take it from the stone out there to the heart here. It's new in its location. It's new that now, somehow, we will be able to do the things that God loves. The Old Testament could tell you what you ought to do, but it couldn't enable you to do it. He so why are you saying that we should do it? He puts his law into my mind and oh, wait, because now we're saved by grace through faith, not by the law. We should now go back to the law. Have you read Galatians? Galatians is literally the argument against this. He says, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Haven't begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you now made perfect by obeying the law? Like, <clears throat> Alan, I appreciate you. I'm just going to relax. 
this ended part like i can i can walk through arguments and stuff like okay this is what they're getting wrong this is how they're twisting scripture but when you start contradicting yourself like this eight more minutes jeremiah you can do this let's, let's, let's finish and writes it in my heart now what does that mean putting it into my mind means he gives me a desire but desire alone is not enough i need ability as well and so the holy spirit gives me power in my heart so the old testament is asking that question you want us to share your holy character but we can't would you give us the holy spirit yes but your temple is hopelessly corrupted how are we going to cleanse the temple the blood of my son and now your temple having been cleansed i can give you my holy spirit amen. and you can walk like i walk amen because that's who you are let's let's read before they butcher fear in god let's read philippians 2 verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, now, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. For, because it is God who works in you both to will. He says, we have the desire now, but we need ability. Okay. And to do for his good pleasure. God is the one enabling us to do these things. So, but to do what? Is it to obey the law? No, it's to live like who we are. You were trying to obey the law. It's like Adam and Eve knowing that God or, or Adam and Eve being made in the image of God, being perfect, now being told that they need the knowledge of good and evil to really be like God. You've, you've received God's spirit. What do you need the knowledge of good and evil for? You have the Holy Spirit to tell you that this is who you are. This is how you should walk. But you're trying to bring us back to the knowledge of good and evil, which was the original temptation of the devil. I'm not saying they're devils, but this is the original temptation. Um, this is why Paul says in, is it 1st or 2nd Corinthians 11, that as the serpent deceived Eve, he is afraid that our minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The serpent deceived Eve by making her think that she needed the law, a law, a knowledge of good and evil to really be like God. That's how the serpent deceived Eve. And that's how we're being deceived today. This is what we need to be on the lookout for. Man, like it's easier to come with teachers who are like doing crazy things on stage. And, you know, there's a place for calling that out. But this is subtle. This is subtleties. This is the trickery of the enemy. This is like, this is so, it's so, it can fly under the radar because it sounds good until you really listen closely and see that they've been contradicting themselves this entire video. Should we fear God? John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Should we reverence God? Yes. But I don't know what kind of fear they're about to talk about. But if it's that kind of fear that's like be afraid because God is so holy that he'll kill you and stuff, we already know where to put that because the Bible has already told us that we are not slaves to fear. We are children and we can call God Abba Father. So we just let this whole thing play through. That's my, that's my, pre, my, my preemptive response to what they say. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Those words were not spoken to unbelievers, but yes, yes, they were. Yes, they were. Like a disciple is not above his teacher. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. Like he's able to. Okay, so. They were, they were spoken to disciples. The disciples were not believers yet because Jesus hadn't died yet. So they were spoken to unbelievers about what God is able to do. Does he do that to believers, though? He's able to kill both body. He's able to destroy both body and soul. But does he do that to believers? I... Then you guys are going to hell because you said you were sinning. Oh, but you repented. But... The Bible says you can't repent. But to his disciples. A lot of New Testament scholars, if they're asked the question, does the fear of the Lord in the New Testament play any role in our salvation or sanctification, would probably dismiss that out of hand and say, no, of course not, you know? Uh, yet they're missing a whole lot of scriptures. We're told to perfect holiness, which is sanctification and the fear of God. Author of Hebrews in chapter four, verse one says, let us fear lest we fail to enter the rest. I meet people all the time tell me they don't fear God. Lest we fail to enter the rest that comes by faith. I'm afraid for someone that says that. Believing in conditional security helped me stay on the straight and narrow. It helped me uh, keep a, a, a conscience that was sensitive to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. So this once saved, always saved doctrine just uh, destroys the fear of God. If we lean on his grace, 
and don't willfully play games with sin, we have nothing to fear. If we choose to play games with sin, we have everything to fear. I see so many Christians. Okay, I know people who, they'll say, oh, people will take advantage, take advantage of grace and continue sinning. Well, I know people who do not preach grace, they do not believe the gospel of grace, but sin is just fine. No one needs a license to sin. You sin without a license. No one tells you that, hey, you want to steal, you can go ahead and steal. Or uh, you want to commit fornication or adultery, you can go ahead. It's fine. No one says that. You do it when you, like, if you don't decide to live according to who you truly are, you do it just fine. Whether you believe in the gospel of grace or not, whether you believe in eternal security or not, you sin just fine. This gentleman here admitted to sinning just fine without believing in, in, the, in eternal security. Who are frustrated because they're trying to live God's way and have their own way at the same time. It won't work. People are taught that once you're saved, you can rebel against God and you can live like hell and still enter the kingdom of heaven. No. That is a lie from the pit of hell. I've got to tell the truth. And if we do oh, not exactly. get serious about it, many of us, we are going to perish because we want to believe a lie and we will heap unto ourselves these false teachers that will... It these are the false teachers who are tickling ears. They're telling you things that you want to hear that, oh, you can do something to be saved. Um, no, the, the ear ticklers are not grace preachers. Grace is very hard to hear, as you could tell from that man in the blue shirt who was so angry at the teaching of grace grace the teaching of grace that tells you that you play no part in your salvation you only receive and rest that's tough to hear but these people these people want their ears to go they want to be told that they can do something it's your ear we are called to holiness it's not optional this is the will of god first thessalonians 4 even your holiness hebrews 12 14 without holiness no one will see the lord without debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh but if you live after the flesh you shall die but if you through the spirit the power of the holy spirit crucify or put to death the deeds of the flesh you shall live that's a warning but also a promise that you can have victory over the flesh read the early church fathers these guys were being martyred for the faith and not giving in and we're walking and living holy lives you know and it's really clear in scripture that we can live a victorious life in fact we expect it to as believers a holy life is very possible jesus said or the bible says he never allows you to be tempted above what you're able to bear that he always provides a way of escape. Take seriously the warning to flee sin or resist the devil or don't quench the work of the spirit in your life. He said to be my disciples, you must pick up your cross and deny your sin. So why do you still sin? Uh, if you're picking up your cross, Jesus was, Jesus meant this literally, come die with me. If you really want to be my disciple, come and die on the cross. Taking up your cross is not trying not to sin. Jesus is the one who denied his godness. He denied, he emptied himself, the Bible says, and died like a criminal, naked on the cross. He's the one who denied himself. We are crucified spiritually. If we wanted to do what Jesus did, we would have to be crucified physically, literally. We didn't take up the cross, he did. He, and that's why I say grace preachers will always point to the work of Jesus and how we benefited from something we didn't work for. These people will point to the work of Jesus and how you need to do more work on top of what Jesus did. And then they'll later contradict what they're saying that, well, we're not saying you should do more work. Self. In other words, you can't be swept away by dopamine. Put your feet down and say, what am I doing? I'm not going to let people leave me to hell. I'm living Fam, God created dopamine. I don't know what that was about, but God created dopamine. So what is, what is wrong with dopamine? Wicked life that I refuse to repent of because they told me I can't. Yeah, you can abuse it, but like, what's, what's like, what is she talking about? You can have victory. You can have victory. The victory is in the power of the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ who will give you power to live a holy life. God really does change us. And, and strongholds really can be broken. Those that used to be addicted can be set free from addiction. The new birth really is. Because of grace. All these things are true because of grace. But you're negating the power of grace in the rest of the documentary. It's a new birth. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Simply seek the Father and walk in the Spirit and you will have victory. Titus, the second chapter, says that the grace of God which has appeared to all men teaches us to say no to ungodliness. It I even forgot about that verse. That's like one of my favorite verses. You were saying grace will tell people to go and sin. And you literally just quoted a verse that tells you that grace teaches you not to sin. Oh, man. If people watch this later, I really pray you stick around to the end to see, to see this, to see this contradiction, to see the double talk. It's very evident. It's so evident. Like, I may not get every verse interpretation right. I may not, you know be very eloquent and stuff but when you shoot yourself in your you shoot yourself in the own foot and and you go against everything you said yourself i mean that's more evidence than i can ever provide grace teaches us not to sin it doesn't teach us it doesn't teach us to sin 
empowers us to live godly lives. What happens is that as that happens, as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control happens in your life, well then, increasingly, you don't want to sin. So we always fall short of God's glory. But it's one thing to say, you know what, I'm not perfect like Jesus yet. It grieves my heart, help me to be more loving and more like Christ. It's another thing to be living a life in rebellion to God, purposely committing adultery and drunkenness and theft and lying and hating on people and, and not really repenting, but saying, hey, I'm sorry, Lord, but continue to walk down the road. That's not true repentance. Jesus preached. Yeah, we repent because we know who we are. And if someone is refusing to repent, it doesn't change who they are. It just means they don't really understand who they are. So you should remind them of who they are. This is why Paul told the Corinthians that, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? They were living, they were literally wilding out, the craziest church. And Paul says, don't you know? He was reminding them of who they are so that they will live according to it. He wasn't telling them that, oh, you are not living this way, so you're in trouble, you're going to go to hell. Preached repentance. He preached, repent, change your mind, change your life. If you don't change your mind, you can't change your life. God is calling us to change our mind. And repent is mean, means a turning about. It's like the military term on the parade ground when you say about turn. They turn 180 degrees and face the other way. Repentance is turning to Jesus Christ in faith, a change of heart, a change of mind, which leads to a change of lifestyle. The word metanoia, repentance, means an, an actual turning away. It doesn't have to do with how you feel about it. I mean, you might feel guilty or you might not feel guilty. It depends on how anesthetized your conscience. Uh, yeah, repentance means turn towards faith in Jesus. And then repentance about a specific sin means change your mind from this sin is not that big of a deal to I'm not I'm not an idolater. I'm not a an adulterer. I'm not a thief. I, I am a believer. I'm a saint. So I want to live like it. Holy Spirit, help me. That's repentance. Um, it has nothing to do with turning away from sin to be saved. That was the in the Old Testament. Repentance in the New Testament is about believing. And then after you've believed because of who you are, you walk like it. Is. It is no longer running down that broad road that leads to destruction that Jesus said many people are on, but it's having a change of heart and a change of mind whereby turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the way, the truth, and life. He's the narrow road. In light of all this discussion about once saved, always saved, and the genuine possibility of apostasy leading to dire consequences and eternal judgment, I believe that we should fall on our knees before God for His grace. Genesis to Revelation. The same grace that you just negated with all your works, gospel. If it's works, it's not grace. If it works, it cannot be grace. Bottom line, God hates sin, but he has given us free will, and there will always be consequences, either way we choose. At the end of the day, it's no one's fault but our own if we miss heaven. No one has an excuse because they will not give diligence to what is already written. There are consequences for sin. If you cheat on your wife, you will lose your family. You will, you will, you will lose a lot in life. If you steal and you get caught, if you murder and you get caught, you... There are consequences on this earth for it, but your identity as a believer does not change. If you're a murderer who's not saved, then that's be that's why you're going to hell. It's because you're not saved. Otherwise, Paul would never have been saved. Okay, there's a lot in here. That, some of them they didn't cover, but I guess they're using it as proof text. Um, credit stuff this is not a marvel movie okay that was a lot um and i think with the reaction and live commentary there's nothing else i have to add my final thought on this documentary is that it is so heavy on workspace salvation that it completely negates grace it completely negates the work of jesus on the cross and then later on, it contradicts what it says. Thank you guys for joining me tonight. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And those of you who joined and were chatting and letting me, letting me know your thoughts live, I appreciate all of you. Denise, Oge, Alan, Jude, you guys are still here. Everyone who joined, I appreciate you all. Um, this was my first ever rea live reaction to anything, and I, I enjoyed it. It was... It was hard to sit through, especially during the contradictory parts where they were nailing Christ to the cross again and again by the things they were saying and the unbelief that they were demonstrating. And the sheer, I won't say they are arrogant, but the things they were saying were arrogant that you could work for your salvation. Oh, but no, but we don't work for our salvation. But you can work for it, though. And you need to do this, though, even though we're not talking about works. 
<sighs> at least it's over now so thank you guys thank you for watching if you've made it this far on the replay and uh I'll see you all next time. Oh, before we go, actually, I have something that might be beneficial. If you want to study this topic in more detail, I have a free ebook called the Eternal Security Cheat Sheet. I'm trying to pull it up real quick. Um, okay. And then let me share that. Um, nope, not that one. This one. There we go. Sorry. All right. Oh, it says I can't share it. There we go. I, I don't know why it's not pulling up, but if you go to jeremiahmensa.com slash ebooks, you will find the eternal security cheat sheet and it will help you study this topic in more detail. Um, there are scriptures, there are verses, a lot of the things that he just brought up that are out of context. I try to give you a little bit of context. It's not so that you can like take what I'm saying, but it's so that you can have a place to start. So I'm sharing that real quick. Okay. So the eternal security cheat sheet right here. If you go to jeremiahmensa.com slash OSOS, it will take you there. You can click on it and you can download this and start studying. I was trying to pull up the actual document so you see what it looks like, but it's free and you just plug in your email and you'll get it. So let me put that in the chat real quick. And yes, I will start that and pin that. Cool. Uh, so thank you all. Y'all still here. All right. So we're done. We're done. Uh, take it easy and I'll see y'all next time. God bless y'all.